evening. The time having arrived and a quorum being present, I hereby call this meeting of the Brockton Finance Committee to order. Before we begin, I'd just like to say that tonight, Councillor at Large Mendez and Count Ward 5 Councillor Thompson are unable to join us for this meeting. Councillor Azak. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would just like to announce that the city, our wonderful city, has lost a true champion. Last week, Dr. Claire Appling, a lifelong Brocktonian, uh, passed away. Dr. Appling began her teaching career in 1954 at West Junior High School. And after that, she was appointed as one of four original house masters at the new Brockton High in 1970. That is when she became the highest ranking woman in Brockton Public Schools um, system. She was a very active member in, in the community. She volunteered. Um, she was actually always, when we um, hosted Keep Brockton Beautiful, she was one of the first people to be there to greet the um, residents that were there to do the cleanup for that day. Um, she amazed us. I know many have stories, anecdotes to tell about her, but um, she was an amazing lady and she's left her mark on her um, wonderful city. So if you, for people at home that want to read the full obituary, she had a very impressive life. Um, it's on, under Conley Funeral Homes website. And um, just want to say that she will be greatly missed. I um, would like to take a moment of silence for Dr. Apley. Thank you. May she rest in peace. May she rest in peace. Thank you. Madam Clerk, item number one. One, ordered that the City Council authorizes the acceptance and expenditure of the total grant funds in the amount of $198 thousand two hundred and sixty three dollars from the Department of Energy Resources DOER Green Communities Division FY 23 Green Communities Comp Competitive Grant Program to the Finance Department FY 23 Green Communities Competitive Grant Program Fund these grant funds will be used to fund the following projects $188,263 for city <coughs> EV charging stations 31 $10,000 city administrative assistant there is no match required for this grant. Invited Troy Clarkson, Chief Financial Officer, Paul Amano, Financial Analyst. Good evening, Mr. Clarkson. Good evening, Madam Chairman. Uh, Mr. Umano is, is out sick uh, today, but I'm happy to answer questions. The Green Communities Act, as you know, was passed by the legislature many years ago, uh, I believe in 2000 and it was quite a while ago, 2012 maybe. Uh, and under the Green Communities Act, the city of Brockton has been fortunate to receive more than a million dollars in grant funds. When we were putting together the application for this most recent um, round of grants, we really wanted to look forward. And under the leadership of the mayor, we put together this application uh, which, as you can see, provides for 31 EV charging stations. Uh, many of those at this point, the sites are still being determined, uh, but our hope is many of those will be at or near the new public safety complex, but also in other sites uh, in the city. So we're very excited about this. We're trying to take a very forward uh, look at uh, Creating this infrastructure now, uh, it's widely expected that the number of electric vehicles in our community and our Commonwealth will increase significantly over the next five to ten years. And so Brockton wants to be ready for that. And we're, so we're creating the infrastructure now for what we're fairly certain will be a necessity in the future. Thank you. Questions, counselors? Motion to recommend favorably. Second. The motion has been made and properly seconded. All in favor? All opposed. Thank you. It passes. Madam Clerk. Two, ordered that the City Council authorizes the acceptance and expenditure of the earmark in the amount of $100,000 from Massachusetts Department of Public Health legislative earmark 
funding grant to the mayor's office legislative earmark funding grant fund. These funds will be used to support the champion pro program. There is no match required. Invited Robert Sullivan, Mayor, Dr. Montessor, Board of Health, Executive Health Officer, Troy Clarkson, Chief Financial Officer. Good evening, Mr. Clarkson. Good evening, Madam Chair. Uh, the mayor sent his regrets to the council president and is at a, another event this evening. I'm happy to answer questions on this. Through the leadership of our legislative delegation, this $100,000 was a legislative earmark in uh, the previous budget process, specifically for the work of the Champion Plan, of course. That is a Brockton-centric plan that provides a continuum of care for those living with addiction in our city. Motion to recommend favorably back to the full city council. Second. On the motion. Um, Mr. Clarkson, I was just wondering, how, who do we dispense the, these funds to? Who do we contract with to carry out the champion plan? So the, the, the champion plan actually is a, an organization that can receive the funds. Uh, I know that uh, the Gandara Center is also a partner in the work that G, the champion plan does. Uh, I believe those are the two entities, but uh, if there are others, I can certainly check on that and get back to you. Okay. In the last uh, grant that we did for the electric charging stations, there was a sentence in it, the grantee shall have a program to combat fraud, waste, and abuse of funds. And I'm just wondering, how do we audit or monitor the use of the, the funds that go to the champion plan? Or do we? Uh, th that's a very good question. Uh, I, I know that uh, the, the funds that we provide directly, uh, one of the things that our new auditor who's here with us tonight is instituting uh, is actually going on site and conducting audits of agencies that receive our funds. Just last week we were discussing uh, the auditor's plan for working with the Brockton Redevelopment Authority to visit them. and so. Uh, one of the plans that Karen has is to actually visit agencies that receive city funds and conduct audits. And so when that occurs, well, I'm happy to share the results of that with you. Sure. Maybe we'll have her on the other side of the, the desk to, on a resolve to report back to us. Thank you. You bet. Counselors, a motion has been made and properly seconded. All in favor? Opposed? Thank you. The motion passes. Madam Clerk. <coughs> Resolve, whereas the Brockton Board of Health is charged with oversight of the health department, now, therefore, be it resolved, the three appointed members of the City of Brockton Board of Health be requested to appear before a committee of the City Council to discuss the policies, oversight, and operations of the department. Invited Dr. Mary T. Brophy, Dr. Craig Andrade, George F. Fisk III. Are Dr. Brophy and Dr. Andrade and Mr. Fisk here? Okay. Hello, Mr. Fisk. Dr. Morrison. Good evening. Well, actually, would you come to the podium? Sorry. And do, are we still expecting Dr. Brophy and Dr. Andrade? I don't know. Uh, uh, Dr. President, uh, Dr. Brophy is in clinic. She did inform me that I'll meet the meeting on Thursday that she might be running late. Okay. I have not heard from them either. Thank you. But I'm sure Dr. Montessor would ask, you know, and answer any questions that you might have. Okay. okay. Well, why don't you, you're, you've been invited to attend, sure. Mr. Fiss, so perhaps we'll start with you. Thank okay. you. Um, counselors? Which is off, is it? Pardon it's me? Yeah. Okay. Counselor Farwell. Uh, good evening. I. I hope at some point we'll have your two other colleagues here. Uh, and let me begin by explaining to you why I filed this uh, resolve and request for you to come in. <clears throat> Counselors have no day-to-day -day responsibilities 
to oversee any city department. However, we do approve an appropriation, and at some point it is perfectly appropriate for us to monitor how is that particular department functioning, how well is it carrying out its mission, and are we holding that particular department accountable for all of its various responsibilities. <clears throat> Pardon me. Now, as appointees of the board, uh, I realize that you have a staff, but at least as far as you're concerned, you can't speak for your other colleagues, would you agree that the Board of Health is ultimately responsible for how well that department operates, yes. how well it functions? Yes. So <clears throat> here are my issues that I'd like to raise. One of them actually happened and, and others I have in writing. We recently had a family that did not have heat or hot water and they called to have an inspection done and I guess it took two weeks and Madam Chair, you can chime in here if I'm wrong. And ultimately we gave that assignment to a Board of Health inspector and he said, I can't go, I have car trouble. And he drives a, a city electric vehicle. I don't know whether he reported that the vehicle was faulty or not, but we ha ultimately had to send another inspector. Uh, I have in writing the fact that uh, inspectors set their own schedule. They decide where they're going to go and carry out inspections. So I guess my first question for you would be, what metrics does the board use to gauge how efficient and how effective the Board of Health is carrying out its mission, whether it's health issues, whether it's inspectional issues, uh, random inspections as required by law, uh, compliance with city uh, ordinances and regulations for either dumpster permits or certificates of occupancy. What, what, how often does the board get into that level of detail and what metrics do you use to gauge how effective the Board of Health is? First, I'd like to say is what you said, if, if it was two weeks and the, and the uh, man hadn't done it, that's totally unacceptable. I mean, people need their heat and hot water, so I, I definitely, and I was unaware of that too. And I do, you know, I, like I said, uh, I've been on the board for quite a while, and, you know, I, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm a funeral director. So, you know, as far as medical training and everything like that, it's, it's just for when I went to school. But we're very lucky to have Dr. Brophy, which, you know, is, is in uh, the VA, and then also uh, Dr. Andrade, who is also with the state. So we're very lucky to have them. They have the medical training, you know, to answer and do some of these things that I probably wouldn't. And we're very lucky to have Dr. Montessor, who is tr trying to do a very good job. And, and some of the, but as far as that particular circumstance right there, I, I don't know what happened to that. I think the Dr. Montessor could, uh, you know, tell you a little bit more about that. And as far as the inning wor works of the Board of Health, uh, I'm, I'm not there all the, day, all the time, but mostly what I get is, is a, lo a lot from the different people all over Brockton because they know me. You know, this isn't done, that isn't done, uh, there's sewage, there's, there's trash here, there's the a dumpster, uh, that type of thing. That's what I get. And then, of course, since I lived uh, overseas and had a funeral home in the Cape Verde Islands, a lot of the restaurant people, that, you know, they're trying to start a restaurant, which is under the... Uh, Hospice of the Board of Health, they come to me a lot of times and I give them advice on that to help them out. But if, if for the uh, inner workings, I'd like to have Dr. Monastor, and he could probably, you know, because he's there all the time, and he could probably get, answer that question a little bit better for you. All right, well, here, here and I do not mean to be uh, difficult, but no. my question is I'll be more direct. Does the board, based on your experience, sit down and have metrics, guidelines, policies where you gauge how effective the Board of Health is carrying out its mission, whether it's inspections, whether it's disease control, any of those things? Do you, do you, and I've read the minutes of some of yes. the meetings. Do you do that? Yeah, Dr. Montessor has a whole sheet each time we have a meeting and we go right through the whole sheet of the things that have been done, you know, in the previous month and leading up because we have monthly meetings. And uh, he's always right there and, and showing after each different thing what we've done, what the synopsis is of, of you know, the things that have done. Uh, I've noticed that we've gotten very good 
uh, ratings. We have excellent ratings as far as the, uh, you know, as far as our immunization from the state. Uh, Money-wise, too, it seems like we're doing very well. So he seems to be, you know, running. Uh, but like I said, the inner workings, I would rather let him talk. But, you know, we do go every meeting, Dr. Brophy and Dr. Andre and ourselves, we do go through the whole meetings. Uh, but it's not like something, if something it did happen or something like that, we are called to go down. But mostly, is, is, I think that's what you, yeah. And a lot of times we have been called to go down. But, uh, you know, it hasn't been lately. I guess what I'm asking is, there are X number of required inspections that have to be done mm -hmm. by the Board of Health. I have in writing the following. The inspectors make their own appointments for inspections. I couldn't tell you where any of them are at any given time. Do we have a process whereby inspectors report to work and they are given inspections that are required to be completed by that day or during that week, and then we cross-check to see if they're done. Because ultimately, sir, you're responsible. I, I'm, I'm sorry to put the burden That's on you. That's all right. I, I don't mind. <laughs> but I, I really can't answer that question because I know they have their daily, uh, you know, chats on the different things they're supposed to do during the, the week and daily. And, of course, it changes, I'm sure, with the different problems that there are. So that might change the regular... But, you know, like I said, Dr. Montessori could probably, you know, help you out as far as that's concerned. All right. Well, I'm, I'm, I, I think what I'm going to do, Madam Chair, after others have had a chance to ask questions, is ask to have this postponed to a following meeting. I think it's important to have the poll board here. It's not fair uh, to have this member answer all of the questions. But I sent an inquiry to the city auditor today to find <coughs> out if any of the health inspectors have requested reimbursement for using their own personal vehicles, which mm -hmm. they're entitled to <coughs> under their collective bargaining agreement. And none of the inspectors in the last three months have put in for any mileage reimbursements. We do have two inspectors, uh, strike that, I think three inspectors, strike that, two inspectors drive a, uh, an electric city vehicle. Uh, none of them put in mileage reports. Now, one inspector puts in a mileage report saying on this particular day or this particular week, here is the mileage that I have with respect to my duties and responsibilities. Now, <clears throat> this isn't my first rodeo, but I, and I feel pretty confident saying that if someone were using their personal vehicle to go out and do the required inspections, they would probably want to be compensated for it. If they're not using their vehicle or if they're using their vehicle for other reasons, not related to their work, then I would be worried that that might, might, emphasis, might be a reason for not submitting a mileage reimbursement. I just think, and I'm not blaming anyone, I think we have a level of dysfunction in the health department that is unacceptable to me as a resident, but certainly as a counselor who votes for an appropriation every year for the health department. And what I really would like to request, and I'll wait until the other board members come in, I'd like to have the three of you get together with Dr. Mondesia, with all of your staff, and come back and tell us as counselors, what can we do better? Where are we deficient? What inspections aren't we doing? Why aren't the inspectors given assignments to go out and conduct inspections? Why are they allowed to basically set their own schedule? Why aren't they putting in for mileage reimbursements? Are they not using their car? Do they have to come into the office? For example, do you know if inspectors have regular office hours where they're available for the, for the public to come in? Yes. They do? Yeah, they come in. I've, I've gone in there and they've been there, and then they have to do their no, duties. No, but I mean ass assigned, I mean. Assigned office hours, like Friday it's Inspector Smith, uh, Thursday it's Inspector Jones, Wednesday it's Inspector Peterson. Do they have assigned office hours? I'd rather ask, if you, no, if you don't, you could probably get a lot more information from Dr. Well, Monaso that runs the daily type of things. We're, we're you know, as uh, doctor, the, the doctors and myself, you know, we have our meetings and we go over the, you know, the, the things that need to be done 
during the month, and we oversee that part of it to make sure that that's done. Now, as far as the everyday workings, I think he could probably answer that, and he'd probably give you an answer on, on the car type of situation right now, too. I, I, he could. I, I, I will tell you my, my, my concern is that <clears throat> the, the health department is so important, I'm afraid there's been a disconnect between the board and the daily people who are there. And I, I guess what I'm arguing in a, in a roundabout way is that I'd like to see the Board of Health members more engaged. Mm -hmm. I'd like to see them hold the department more accountable. I'd like them to design some metrics to gauge how effective the inspectors are. For example, I, someone asked me to ask a question, are all of the inspectors lead paint certified that are, that are conducting lead paint inspections? Do, do you know that? No, I don't. Okay. Madam Chair, I'm, I'm going to stop at this point. If there are other questions, uh, fine. But if not, I, I will be offering a motion to postpone this to another meeting in April when we can gather the other two members because I think this, important, this, this discussion in the health department is that important to our residents. Thank you. So Answers. I don't know if anyone else has any questions. Okay. Second, we'll second the motion. Right, then I'll, uh, formal motion to postpone this to a FinCom meeting in April. Second. second. Okay. Motion has been made and properly seconded. All in favor? Opposed? Thank you. Motion to postpone carries. Thank you, sir. For, I didn't mean to put you alone on the hot seat. I, I, I so. don't really mind. You have some great questions, and, and they should be answered. And uh, <clears throat> could I say a, few, a couple of things? It seems like you know, in the change after, uh, you know, our former mayor died, there was a change. We were very m more involved, myself and Dr. Brophy, and, and we were more involved in the, in the everyday workings. And it seems like now a lot of times uh, when we have a meeting or something like that, a lot's already been decided upon. You, you understand what I'm saying? That we really don't have as much of a say like we used to have. Uh, I mean, there was a lot of things that we used to do. I mean, as far as the, you know, even the animals and, and different things. Of course, COVID changed, I understand that, changed a lot of things. Uh, but still, you know, it, it seems like we had a, a little bit more idea what was going on uh, and a little more working, you know, all the time. And now it just seems like a lot of things have already been discussed and already taken care of. And I don't know where that comes from, but that's, you know, one of my little, I can, I can see that, you know, having been on the board for quite a while. Madam Chair, if I could just have a little leeway here. Yeah, that's uh, Under Chapter 111, I think it's Section 28. I could be wrong, but an annual report from the Board of Health in a community has to be filed with that community, in this case with the City Council. So I don't know if any of those annual reports have been filed in the last few years. I don't remember seeing them. But I would definitely like to see for, for calendar year 22, I'd like to see the annual report for the Brockton Board of Health delivered here at some point in the next month or so. If I have it right it. here if you want it. Well, I, I, I hope it's a little more comprehensive than well, that. Well, it's, 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 it's something anyway. Uh, if you, if but like. then, then hold on to that, and okay. I'd be glad to receive that before our meeting in April. Okay. And we'll I thank sure you again you for your that. service. I mm -hmm. thank you for your service, seriously. Thank you. Thank you, Madam. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Clerk. <clears throat> Item four, resolve. Be it resolved by the Brockton City Council to invite representatives from Brockton's Downey Youth Baseball, Brockton Baseball, Brockton Blazers Softball, and Brockton Youth Soccer Association to provide information about their prospective organizations program offerings and registration details. Invited, Joseph Barolini, Brockton Baseball, John Stevens, Downey Youth Baseball, Al Basler, Brockton Blazers Softball, Nolan Napier, Brockton Youth Soccer Association. Good evening, gentlemen. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Who would like to go first? Let's resolve this. Anybody? Sure. Madam Chair? Yes. Could I just start everything off? Councillor Lally. Thank you, Madam Chair. Councillors, I, I sponsored this, uh, you know, largely for the folks at home. Uh, we've been seeing a decline 
in, you know, uh, people getting involved with, you know, youth sports all over. Uh, and it's had a, you know, a noticeable effect in the city. Um, I think I can speak for a lot of us as saying, you know, doing, doing youth sports is a tremendous, you know, opportunity as a kid. Uh, and I want to make sure that we, you know, protect and grow the organizations we have committed to providing these opportunities for the kids. So, you know, we have, you know, four of these agencies here tonight, uh, just like the resolve says, to, you know, provide information, you know, touch on what the programs offer uh, and how you could get involved or contact them for more uh, information. Gentlemen, I, I turn it over to you. Good evening. Uh, my name is John Stevens. I am president of Downey Youth Baseball. I've been involved in that league on the board in some way or another for about the last 10 years and was even previously on the board with uh, Brockton Baseball. Um, probably about eight to 10 years ago, there were five um, baseball leagues in the city, and we're down. Joe and I represent the last two. Um, we offer baseball for boys and girls from ages 4 to 18. And um, our prices range from, uh, I think, T-ball and rookie, which is 4 to 6 and 6 to 8, respectively, is $50. And then um, minors and majors, which is 10 to 12 um, and 8 to 12, respectively, that's $100. And Babe Ruth, which is 13 to 15 and 16 to 18, respectively, is uh, $120. Um, what we do at Downey is we offer free registration through the way of participation in our calendar raffle fundraiser, where if you sign up your, your child for $50, we give you five tickets, you sell those to friends and family, and you keep the money, and that's how it's free to the... To the, to the family. So uh, we really, you know, a lot of the registration money that we get, it pretty much all goes to uniforms and then goes back to that, that fundraiser. So we really rely on sponsors. And um, this year, um, well, let me back that up a little bit. Uh, you can register with us. Um, we have an in-person registration tomorrow at the Downey School at seven o'clock, six o'clock, I apologize. And you can sign up anytime at www.downeybaseball.com. Um, but this year, we're actually, because of the dwindling numbers and uh, players and volunteers for a second straight year, we're, we're trying to do like a strategic alliance with Brockton Baseball, which we think is best. Um, I'll let Joe speak on his behalf, but we think it's best for the youth, um, you know, in the baseball program in the city to develop that, um, to pool our resources, pool our volunteers, and put, best, uh, put forward our best possible program. So, thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Joe Berolini from Brockton Baseball, and uh, like John indicated, we're playing together this year. Hopefully, uh, that will continue in the future. There's not enough kids playing baseball right now. Two years ago, we partnered with the community schools, and we thought that that might increase our enrollment. It really didn't. I, I thought we were going to get a lot more kids. But if kids want to sign up at Brockton Baseball, we will be playing with Downey, but you can sign up through the community schools. If you have any questions, you can look at the Facebook page, Brockton Baseball, or uh, my personal email is jberolini at comcast.net, B-E-R-O-L-I-N-I. -E and uh, I'm happy to be working with Downey. Good evening. Good evening. Al Basler, the president of Brockton Blazers Softball. We are Brockton's only youth softball program. We have programs through the spring all the way through the fall. Our spring accommodates girls from ages 6 to 14, and then we open that up up to age 18 in the summer and the fall. We have registration open now. You can register at our website, brocktonblazersoftball.com. Our registration for our 8 and under program is $50, and our 9 and up is $80. We keep our registration costs as low as we can to just cover operating costs. Everything else we try and do through fundraising so that we can help bolster the program. Our uh, email, if anybody has any questions or needs any information on our program, how to join, any other concerns, it's BrocktonBlazersSoftball at gmail.com. Where do you play? Where do you? Our games are at the Raymond School. Thank you. We also, we also do travel a little bit. We play with uh, our neighbors in Holbrook often. 
evening. Hi, good evening. Thank you for this opportunity, John. Thank you, appreciate it. My name is Nolan Napier, and I'm the president of Brockton Youth Soccer. Um, we offer up the program from four years old all the way through 19 years old for girls and boys. Um, our registration, our website is brocktonyouthsoccer.com. And uh, we have different tiers, so we offer a rec program that includes every kid, no matter how talented you are, you get to play. And then we have the travel program, and then we have what we call the club program for all our players, so we tier them based on their skill set, so they get to compete throughout the, the state and regionally as well. So they're all Brockton kids, they, so we train them and we put them in until they reach the high school level, the freshmen, sophomores, and the, and the varsity team as well. So, um, but our cost is $80 to sign up and then we tier it based on the number of kids in the family. So if you have three kids, it goes down, you know, it's $50 per kid. And what we do, we have a lot of financial aid available, so there's some families that can't afford it. So we subsidize them throughout that. Our challenges are the field situation in Brockton. Um, we have to pay for all the fields, so we do have to pay for the rental of Marciano. We do have to pay for, we rent the gyms throughout the, the school gyms throughout the winter session right now. So whatever gyms are available to us, we get to rent it so we can train the kids. So most of our costs go towards financing those, those gyms and all that stuff. But uh, yeah, we, are, we would love to have them. We have about four to 600 kids in our program. Um, and basically it's all volunteers, all coaches are volunteers, so we work on the parents that volunteer their time. We do offer training, we do offer licensing, we license our coaches. They all Corey checked, they all have to go through the safe sport, they go through the concussion programs, so we read they really, all the coaches and everybody's um, well trained to take care of our kids. So we look forward to having as many kids sign up as possible. And our season starts at the end of April, uh, April 29th. Thank you. That's all out. Oh. Councilor Minicello. Good evening. Um, first of all, I would like to thank the four of you for the commitment and the sacrifice that you make to, the, to our youth here in Brockton. Um, it's I, I, know, I know a bunch of you, and uh, I know how much time you spend away from your families and how, how many years you've been doing it. And you've been extremely successful, all of you. Um, so we want to, as a council, I think we all want to thank you for, I know we all want to thank yes. you for your commitment and what you do for, for the kids of Brockton. It's, it's a nice outlet for, you know, for many kids and you basically provide them, many of them, with mentors. And, and I've seen it personally. My children, you know, participated in soccer, in baseball, in, in Brockton sports. So um, I did not have, I was not blessed with girls. So I did not have girls in youth softball, but many of my friends did. And, you know, the Ross family, you know, they, they, they love softball. And, you know, and they, uh, their kids were very successful. Um, and the Han family, <laughs> very close to me. Um, but um, if there's something that we can do in terms of, I know um, Nolan just mentioned about the costs of, you know, the gyms. And, and those are costly. You know, part of our problem with that is, you know, we have to um, reimburse and, and pay the, you know, the custodians and people to supervise, you know, when, when the kids are in the building. We can't just hand over the keys and, and let, you know, people just have the buildings, uh, free reign of the buildings, but maybe we can try to speak with the school department and, and, and do something um, to try to um, make it a little more um, accessible, so to speak. Um, if there's something that we can do as a council, please get in touch with me in terms of conditions of fields, uh, you know, resources that perhaps the city could um, join with you. Um, because this is a, a great opportunity for our kids to get um, off of uh, the streets and basically, you know, in with other children, getting, um, you know, learning, uh, you know, the values. Basically, you know, you, pro you provide an opportunity not only for sports, but to provide kids with, with values from, you know, adults that care. Um, you know, many of many coaches have influenced so many um, uh, students and, and children in this in this city, um, and, and they've gone beyond, you know, uh, youth sports and gone you know at the college level, scholarships in colleges. Um, you know, girls, boys. Um, there, there's so many. You know, Brockton is the city of champions for a reason. I mean, you know, we we you know we we, we dominate in certain sports. I mean, you know. Baseball at one time, you know, was huge. Football was huge. 
you know, the faces of Brockton are changing, and um, you know, our soccer, our soccer uh, teams, pretty darn competitive. You know, the high school's done pretty darn well. Um, so, so what we can do to, to, to help you, please let us know. Um, and we all know how much, how much you've done and, and do for the kids. So I, I, can't, I just wanted to compliment you and, and know that we're all accessible. Every one of us wants to help out you know, to get these kids involved. So anything we can do, you know, I know all of us you know, want to. My friend, my friend here has a little one growing up. Mine, mine unfortunately, are this, but oh, taller than me. So he has, he's a, has a vested interest in this. So, you know, so, you know, we're all, we're all have a vested interest because basically the youth in this city, we want them to go beyond and, and, and for good things. We don't want, we don't want them known for, for, you know, bad things. We want them known for good things. And you guys help provide that, that avenue for, for that. So, and I just want to say thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Rodriguez. Oh, did you want to go first? No, go ahead. Well, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And um, I want to echo the uh, comments of my colleague from Ward 1 in, in a sense of uh, appreciation for the work that you guys do in the community because you do this on a voluntary basis and you do it for the love of the children in this community. Um, I actually, I'm glad that Council uh, Minicello brought up the fact that the, uh, the cost sometimes might be uh, something that prevents some kids from signing up. Uh, but we were, uh, a couple years ago in this council when we were debating the, the marijuana uh, funding to the city, one of the things that we had proposed to, as part of the, uh, the um, ordinance is to deal with marijuana sales in the city is that some of the proceeds from the, uh, I know the CFO is probably having a heart attack right behind you because I'm bringing this up. Um, but one of the things that we had talked about is some of the proceeds were supposed to be divved up into some of the areas that we felt, uh, because it's not really a tax. It's not something that was being generated from, you know, businesses that were coming in uh, in terms of development and things like that. These are things that we felt that since it has a major uh, taxing in our communities, that it was important for us to take some of those funds and invest it into youth programming, into the parks and things like that. So I think uh, one of the things that we can probably do is have a discussion, a serious discussion with the city to see if we can take some of those funds that were designated for that purpose to invest into the kids in this community because I mean, it's the same thing that I, I work for the Archdiocese of Boston, and one of the things that I used to have a conversation with the Cardinal and everybody else is that I find it fascinating how in 1950, the city of Brockton had 60,000 people. In 2020, 2020, with the new census that came out, this city is now over 106,000 people. So we're gaining population. So if we're gaining population, how are we losing either churches in some instances or youth programming or children programming in a community that's growing. You know, so I think we have to somehow realize, I mean, I know tons of kids from my ethnic group that love baseball. But sometimes I think it's the way we're going about maybe not getting those kids involved in that program that I think we need to do a better job, all of us, in terms of promoting the program because the love for the game is still there. It's not just soccer, you know. Yes, soccer is the majority of it, but it's not just soccer. It's baseball, it's softball, it's basketball. You name it, it is across the board. So I think we got to do a better job as a city itself to somehow uh, help you folks, your good folks that are volunteering your lives and souls to, uh, to do this for our kids in our community, that the rest of us need to do a better job in terms of uh, providing you with some resources to, to help ease the pain, for instance, of paying for fields. You know, if the city has the funds for that purpose, then we ought to use it for that purpose. You know, we had uh, a couple, uh, a year or so ago, some $20 million that went to 40, 40 something organizations in the community. God, know, God knows, and I, I, you know, I wanted to ask that question, but I think I was gonna do that in private with the CFO in terms of finding out whether or not you know, and those funds are being put into play for the right reasons and the right causes because they're tax, they're tax dollars from these taxpayers in this community. So I'd rather see some of the revenue that we actually have 
a discretionary revenue invested into the children of this community because it's either we do it that way or in a few more years, some of those kids, the police department will be standing where you're standing asking for more resources to lock them up. So we can do a better job in terms of providing them something ahead of time. Maybe we can just save the jail spaces for other individuals and other things, or other communities, not necessarily Brockton. So I, I wanna go back and, and, and echo what the councilor from Ward one, Ward 1 said, that I believe that we gotta do a little bit more from our standpoint to designate some funds to youth programming. Yes, we talk a lot about you know, how we want to do this for the kids, we want to do that for the kids, but when it, times, when it comes time to put up or shut up, often we shut up. So I want to make sure that I echo that publicly in appreciation to the work that you know, the four of you guys and the many more affiliated with you are doing that you know, this city needs to step up a little bit and help uh, you know, the, the youth programming in this community because you know, we've got a great high school that has great programs, but if we don't come up with a feeder program to feed into, into the, the school system, then pretty soon that too is gonna fall apart. Because I think it starts with the, with the little guys and the little girls and stuff, so I think we have to do a better job in doing that. And I think, um, there's not 11 of us here today, but I think you're gonna get 11 of us to basically sound exact the same way, because I know that I feel that way, and I think my colleagues also feel that way, that. You know, we're here to provide you with, with whatever, whatever resources. You're providing the volunteerism, mm -hmm. and I think it's only fair that we provide you with the resources to help you out. Uh, thank you. Again, thank you for all if that I you may, do. If I may, uh, thank you, Mr. Rodriguez. Thank you, Ms. Michella. So as um, Ms. Michella knows, I've been doing this for about 23, 24 years now, and I've always made a recommendation to the superintendents and the previous two mayors that the, idea, the ideal part is to have a, a youth sports task force. And, and, and that where all the youth sports are under one umbrella or manager, where we can actually, because the resources that we're looking at, the, we all fighting for fields, and every year, Mr. Michelle, we would have to call, we have to ask. There's nothing set in place for the youth sports that we can, we might have a challenge amongst ourselves. So I, if I can recommend something is from a city standpoint is that we have a youth task force and we build a task force individuals from the different youth sports that sit on this task force they gather their thoughts there and what works for them what does it most so if a softball team is, has to go somewhere or they need funding we can all do it together but I guess also we can share the same resources and we can actually work together in building the programs and that's support the school because we are the qualified coaches, we are licensed coaches, we are UEFA coaches, but our coaches in the schools are just teachers and they're just parents and our kids are not getting the right training. And the competition that they have against them, against the outsourcers, so the other schools got professional coaches and everything. So we're falling behind. We're really working hard on the youth side, but we want to bring it under one umbrella where we can actually help our kids. It's all about the kids. <coughs> that we can take them. And I think a youth task for starting with that so we can see what we have, what we can work with, because our fields are in really bad condition. You know, we go from Hillstrom to Snow Park to where we challenge with the, so also we can mix adults programs with youth programs at the same fields because there's, there's, a, there's a safe sport. There's all these sexual harassment, there's all the stuff we have to follow, all the <coughs> guidelines. So we can have kids at the same field with adults playing at the same areas. So we, there's a risk we run there as well. So when we look at that, so we have to start, how do we meet the needs of the youth, meet the needs of the adults? But I think if we can all get under one roof one, and start discussing in the city, it will help us because we only have one tough field in the city. And you know we've been charged thousands of dollars to actually rent the field, you know? and. So it's very tough on us to go back to the parents and say, you have to come up with two, three hundred dollars to actually play your home games at Marciano because we're required to have a turf field at the regional level. But we can't, pro so I'll call Zalinda, I'll call the, the school department and say, I need a field. And then we told these are the costs of the field. And so we have to divide it amongst the costs. So, but I think if we can all come together and just under form a youth task force, I think we can really meet the needs of our kids in, a, in the families. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, no, Madam, Madam Chair, Chair, I think that's a great idea just it's, to finish off. Just as a point of information, I'm, I'm getting text messages that we have 
no volume and the meeting is off the uh, That's right. Uh, I, I just wanted other counselors to know that. Councillor, is that? I think she told. Well, through you to Councillor Farwell, um, we, I spoke with uh, BCA and they were aware of the situation. We won't be live this evening, but it will, our meeting will air recorded tomorrow. Yeah, so I just wanted to, to, to finish that off and, and let you know that the school department actually is working on a master plan. At least, I don't know if you guys saw some of the, the renditions that went around of putting together some, you know, uh, hopefully it will happen. I don't know exactly when, because everything costs money and serious money in some instances. But at least there's some combination fields where there's some baseball, softball, soccer, football, in a lot of these things, and it's all turfed in a way, because I think you're absolutely right. Even, not just even with the, you know, the fact that it's unsafe for young, young kids to play with adults, but it's also unsafe in a way that the fields themselves could be dangerous. I mean, I broke an ankle playing soccer at, uh, at Pickfield, you know, and it's still, I mean, I'm not the greatest soccer player either, but I, you know what, I could do my part, but it, I broke an ankle, at least I left it there. So it's, what happens, you step in a hole, yeah. uh, because it happens to have holes all over the place. So if we have some decent facilities in a city like ours, which we should have, <laughs> Uh, hopefully we'll come up with some funds to put some of these uh, fields into into play or into action uh, sooner rather than later. But I think it's something that, you know, if you want to, and I like the idea of, of putting together the, uh, the task force to kind of look and work amongst ourselves in a way. Because you know what? You know, it's 2023, and I think we got to look beyond, you know, what we did 20, 40, 50 years ago and look, and look forward to what we can do in this city to make, make sure that, the lives are better for the young people coming up behind us. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. And thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Councillor Azak. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I'm going to echo my colleagues. Um, you know, we're all here for you. That's what we're here for. But I would like to go on the record advocating for the um, Brockton Youth Softball for the Blazers. Um, so it's, this is where it becomes complicated. We can't figure out who needs to maintain that field, whether it's a city, whether it's a school, at the Raymond School. So I just want you to know that I haven't forgotten you. We're working on it, and I'm happy to hear my colleagues speak on the matter that, you know, this is really important to us. Um, so I will advocate for you. At the state level, I've already spoken to our, uh, some of our state delegation to see what we can do to bring in funding. I know the Downey field's getting some funding uh, this year to some, get some work done on it. But we, I mean, the Raymond School's in, in pretty bad shape and our uh, kids really deserve to have a safe and well-maintained field. So we, we're here for you. I just wish things were easier, but if Mr. CFO is listening, maybe we can send some money towards, towards the Raymond um, School field. I know Council Lally and myself were there last year for your championship. I mean, our kids are champions. They are, they're winning championships. We have um, kids from other cities and towns that are here. So we really want to um, you know, represent our teams and our schools well, so we, we do need to have well-maintained facilities. So um, we're doing our best. It's not easy, but, um, you know, I'm, like I said, I'm happy to hear that everybody here is, we're all on the same page. I think it's great to have um, you, uh, a, whether it's soccer, whether it's any sport, baseball, softball, uh, football, but we need to have a group come together that's really dedicated to our sports. So I think this is great, and I, you know, I can't say enough that you can all reach out to us anytime, um, and we're we're going to do the best we can. I wish it was easier. I wish it was quicker, but it's not. But I thank you, gentlemen, for all you do because it's really important. You make a difference in our kids' lives, so it's really important. Before I entertain a motion. I just wanted to say, as the Ward 4 counselor on the south side of the city, I would be remiss if I didn't say, there is one other league, Brockton Boxers Baseball. They play in the, the, the baseball field behind the Gilmore School. This is going to be their third year. And like you, they're struggling. Every year, though, they've increased their membership and the, the, the children who play. Um, maybe you'll all be playing each other at some point. Mr. Barley has actually reached out to 
ask them if they wanted to combine, you know, forces and players to do, you know, a larger league. Mm -hmm. I think they said they'd get back to you, right? We have reached out to them. And I've reached out to this gentleman last year as well about Good. pooling resources. And, and Good. I've been... I've been advocating for them for improvements to the field, you know, there too. So I'll mention it to them as well. Thank you. Uh, Councillor D'Agostino. Uh, I'll be quick. Thank you for coming and for all of you do. Of course, I echo the comments of my colleagues. Um, just more of a general comment that I'm saying for hopefully the CFO to hear <laughs> is uh, some time ago, there was a discussion about fields and taking better care of the fields for these programs, the, the, these guys and, and others. And there was supposed to be other staff added and the school department was gonna kick in for some of it and it never happened. And I know that that was discussed because I was a part of the discussion at the time on the school side. So maybe this year's budget, we can get back to that, to, to that discussion about seeing if we need to put more people on, or do we have adequate staff to take better care of these facilities that we have? Um, I know it was discussed in the past, nothing materialized. I'd love to see something materialize with this in, in the upcoming budget. Um, and I'll just conclude with thanking you guys for everything you do for the youth of the city. And, um, you know, it, I, I was thinking as we were sitting, as I was sitting here, it really does make a lasting impact. I wasn't involved in <coughs> athletics as a kid, but many of my uh, friends were, uh, my adult friends were, and in their 40s talk about coaches that they had in youth programs. So you do really make a lasting impact for these kids. And I uh, just hope you know that. Thank you. Can I say one more oh, thing? Sure. The next three Sundays at the Brockton High School gym from 1 to 3, we're running a free clinic for 5 to 10 year olds. So any, everybody is welcome to come up and just to sign in and uh, you can have some fun. Thank you. Councilor Lally. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I want to thank you guys for coming in again and, and for, you know, all that you're doing. Uh, in, in my youth, a long, long time ago, I did, uh, I did play soccer, and the fact that I saw any field time is testimony to their inclusive policies. Um, but, no, this is something that I think is, is very important, not only for, you know, uh, you know, for the city now, but for the kids in the future. Um, you know, I know it's been said, but whether you know it or not, you you're, have a tremendous impact on these kids. Um, you're helping, you know, teach them the, you know, competitiveness, uh, you know, the, the rules of the game. Um, you're helping show them that hard work really does equal success. The time they put in in practice translates to the performance on the field uh, and that is something that you know it's 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 hard to get other places so sports have a you know a significant importance I would say in you know the upbringing of, of our kids um, I, I want to just you know give everyone the opportunity to offer any kind of closing remarks but you know brag a bit talk about you know, why it's great to be a part of the organization. As Councillor Azak already touched on, the Brockton Blazers champions how many times? We had two championship teams in 2021. Back to back, there we go. But if anyone wants to offer any, anything, I, I want to turn the floor over. Well, first of all, I just want to thank Councillor Azak. Uh, your support has been very much appreciated. I do want to also say that we do have a very good relationship with the Brockton Public Schools facilities. They do a great job helping us maintain the fields at the Raymond School. We just don't have the facilities there that we need to, to, to compete, even on an aesthetic level, with some of the other cities and towns that we play with. And that's one of our biggest hurdles, is our girls go to other cities and towns and they see the fields there, and then they're almost embarrassed when other teams come to Brockton, which should never be the case. And that's what we want to do. We want to just strive to do whatever we can to provide the best experience for our girls in this city. Um, but as Council Lally did just mention, we, we have had recent success with some of our teams. Uh, 2021, we were actually here. Uh, the mayor had invited us to celebrate. We had two summer championship teams. 
We won the South Shore Summer Softball League our 10U and 14U girls. And uh, that success has continued into 2022 and we're looking forward to a great 2023 season. And whether we win or not, the important thing is that we have girls that come through our program and they make lifelong friends through softball. And that is one of the things that we want to foster and we want more girls in Brockton to have that opportunity. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. Yeah, I just want to speak to what we do as well. As um, we, we've, for Brockton Youth Soccer, they've won a number of state championships in the past almost every year. One of the challenges we've had this year, where our city has been discriminated against by the Mass Youth Soccer and the South Shore League, because our kids went to school early. Brockton allowed them to go to school early, so they wouldn't allow our kids to compete against kids of their same age anymore. So we're having that challenge right now with them where we, we're still looking for guidance on how to handle it because they want to associate our kids based on grade and not age. So they don't get to compete against kids their own age. So um, that's one thing we would like to challenge. But on the other side, on the good side is that we do take our kids this, at the end of this month, we'll be in a college showcase with all our high school kids from the ones from junior sophomores all the way through seniors, they'll be competing. So we had to build a relationship with an external organization so our kids can compete, so we can expose them to college coaches so they can get scholarships. So they'll be competing in a showcase at the end of the month. So we want to wish them all the best as well, especially our, our seniors this year. This is their year. So, um, but uh, yeah, we, we definitely need all the support from the city. And if you can help us also with Hills from Farm Park, I know that belongs to the city. It's, in, um, it's supposed to be our home field. Um, the teams that showed up would not play us over there. So we can only practice at Hillstrom, but we cannot have any games at Hillstrom because it's not safe. Um, so if, uh, if we could get help, that looks into with the Brockton Parks Department, we'll appreciate it as well. Thank and you. where is that field, sir? That's it's up on by North Carey North Street. Carey Street. Okay. Yeah. Thank so you. I can say to that that Mayor Sullivan has committed to putting money into the park. Thank you. To spruce it up as part of his commitment to cover uh, each ward with investments in, in parks. Uh, the CFO may have something to add on it if he would be permitted, Madam Chair. Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to the volunteers here for all the great work that they do for the city. Council O'Lally is correct, and in and, and a future resolve, I know the mayor and I will be appearing before the city council to provide an update on our investments in the city parks and playgrounds. And through uh, the American Rescue Plan, the mayor has committed several million dollars uh, to directly benefit the parks and playgrounds in the city. Uh, and when we make that report, we'll provide an actual uh, update with schematics of the plans. Uh, in, a, in the pursuit of fairness, those monies will be invested uh, in every ward in the city. So uh, we, we've worked hard uh, to discuss with the, the Parks Department, with many of you, what those investments should be. So we look forward to, uh, to discussing those in detail at a future date. But right now, uh, the design is underway for those investments. And so we're very excited about that, that we'll address some of the issues we're hearing tonight. Thank you, Mr. Clarkson. And now you two know each other. So there's no escape, Mr. CFO. All right. <laughs> I'm easy to find. Um, oh. Councilor Minicello. Uh, just, just a brief statement. I, I think what we need to do is have a, a working meeting, so to speak, with, with the mayor, involve the mayor, and perhaps through you, um, Madam President, you can um, have a discussion, discussion with the mayor that we certainly appreciate the investments going to be done to new facilities. But in the meantime, we have obviously fields that we have in operation today that, that need some TLC and some attention. Um, so that, uh, you know, I, I don't think we have the time to wait for a lot of new fields. I think we need to maintain, we have to take care of what we have first and, and then move on to the new fields, basically. And, and, and if we can have that conversation and perhaps certainly talk to the CFO about resources. Um, um, Councillor Rodriguez, you know, mentioned you know, the marijuana money. You know, 
I think we need to find, I think we need to be creative with, with pots of, uh, I'm not going to say surplus money, but free, free cash or, or new revenues that are coming in that have not, have not been um, permanently allocated to any, any particular source so that we, we, we need to maintain what we have. We have to take care of what we have in this city. And, and a lot of us have been talking about, you know, we're not asking for miracles. We, the, the, the taxpayers of this city really want clean streets, clean parks, safe environments. It, you know, that's, that's the bread and butter, I think, of, uh, of our position as counselors in terms of providing that to our, our tax paying taxpayers and citizens of Brockton. And which will, of course, take care of our youth, and that's what this is all about. You know, that's why we all serve to have a healthy city, and it, and it starts with the youth. And if you have a healthy, healthy uh, youth, the city grows, the roots grow, the, the the city becomes a great place. And as we know, Brockton has a, a strong tradition of of strong youth sports. Uh, you know, certainly the high school provides all sorts of opportunities. We we know the the, the successes, but I think it's time we have to take inventory of what we have. You know, in a positive way, all of us, you know, motivated to work together. You know, uh, Nolan, you know, Mr. Napier, you know, made a great suggestion, a task force. So, so I think we, through you, I think you, I have faith in you that you can have a nice conversation with the mayor, who's certainly vested in the city and has children of his own that participate in sports. So, I think this is, there's no reason why we can't get this done together, really, and and not make it a, you know, a big federal case. You know, you know. I know that um, our CFO is very well versed and creative and seems to be able to find resources when necessary and, and certainly I think we all agree that the resources for our kids is absolutely necessary and, and, and we can do it. Yeah, none of us really cares about who gets credit. We, we, we want to just provide for the community. That's it. You know, and, and that's the bottom line. It, it's not so complicated. It's a very simple. I think it's very simple. Prioritize. Let's prioritize and, and the fields and the condition of the fields for our kids that should be a huge priority. Thank you. Councilor so. Lally. Well, thank you. I just wanted to, you know, uh, just say that I think that we could certainly advocate to find more discretionary funding, you know, or money out of discretionary funding for, for improvements. And I think that putting together the, the city and the school end of things to examine uh, examine both and make sure there's not wasted or duplicated efforts in some places would be uh, a very prudent thing to do. Um, and like Councillor D'Agostino touched on earlier, uh, when he was on the school committee, uh, him and I worked uh, closely along with the mayor and the CFO to determine a, uh, you know, a way to improve things and add a couple of positions to the Parks Department. Um, those positions I'm, I'm sure due to, you know, budgetary constraints weren't, you know, have not been added now, but I, I think I could echo him in saying I, I would like to see them in the upcoming budget. Um, and I don't know what the, the rest of you gentlemen would think about it, and I'm certainly not going to put you on the spot and ask you now, but uh, I think that it's Mr. Napier's idea of, you know, some sort of NCAA for Brockton uh, would be a, a pretty interesting idea. Um, I think that we could go ahead and really, you know, find the language and find the way to make it a, you know, official part of the city as well. You know, I think I would be, ha I, I'd be happy to file and I'm sure I, you know, the, the rest of the council would be happy to, to jump on board some kind of ordinance to add a official city committee on youth sports with representation from all of the leagues and the sports. Uh, you know, that would certainly help to streamline things. And, you know, we, it's, it's worth exploration. But, um, you know, I, I want to thank the, the counselors for, for all, all they had to say and, you know, lifting it up. And I want to thank you guys for coming in. Uh, if nobody has anything else, I would like to make a motion to recommend this favorably. Second. All right, a motion has been made and properly seconded. All in favor? Opposed? Thank you. The motion carries. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Best of luck this season. Five, resolve to invite Dr. James Bruce to appear before a committee of the Brockton City Council to discuss the growth of the Brockton Cultural Affairs and Tourism Group. 
in the past year and to inform the public of the Cultural Affairs Expo to occur on March 25th, 2023. Invited Dr. James Bruce. Thank you, Mr. Bruce. Good evening. Good evening. How are you? I'm well, and you? Awesome and amazing. Just Welcome. Like Greetings. My name is Dr. James Bruce. I'm a proud resident of Brockton for almost 20 years. I'm excited with the optimism about the potential <coughs> greater promise that Brockton the City of Champions, we talked about that this evening, is on track to realize. I am particularly exuberant about the work that the Cultural Affairs and Tourism has done the last year at the free first annual expo, which created an opportunity for Brockton area residents, businesses, organizations, and the city, state, and officials to meet, greet, and exhibit, vend, and share information about events and the bright future of Brockton. The success from last year's free expo commands another performance this year at the Brockton Community Access, located at number one North Main Street on March 25th, 2023. And it's gonna be held from 10 in the morning to two in the afternoon. I'll be there, along with DW Field Associates, the uh, Brockton Garden Club, the African American Association, and many more organizations will be there. Please join us. I would like to briefly share why cultural affairs and tourism is such an important and useful asset to Brockton. It has encouraged me to be active in the community socially, civically, and professionally. As a family man with a small retail business, printed expressions and gifts, a custom printing shop, located at 1130 North Main Street in Brockton, a substitute in the Brockton, in the Brockton Public Schools, a published, published author of more than 50 books, international singer-songwriter, board member of the Brockton High School Vocational Career Education, and the founder and the director of Team Veronica Cancer Resource Center here in Brockton. It's a nonprofit in mem memory of my baby sister, Veronica Bruce Butler, a Brockton resident who succumbed to double breast cancer in 2021. I invite you, I am joyful about the many opportunities that cultural affairs and tourism provides to the people of Brockton to get involved as champions. The next meeting is gonna be on Thursday, March 9th at 6 p.m. at North Baptist Church. For more information, you can contact Ann at 774-297-4939. Again, 774-297-4939. Thank you. Thank you. Answers? Any questions? So I would just like to thank uh, Dr. Bruce for coming and putting this together, giving everyone the information about the um, Cultural Affairs and Tourism uh, Expo, which is a free expo. Uh, to, I know we had last year there were people from Brockton, there were even some people from surrounding towns that were at the um, uh, North Baptist Church. So this is... Um, it's really an organization that was put together. Actually, it started at one of the resolves here in, uh, at City Council with Ann Beauregard and Pastor um, Reed from North Baptist Church. So um, it, the phone number you gave out is Ann Beauregard. So if anybody would like to get more information about getting uh, a table or presenting at the expo, um, then please feel free to contact her and um, get more information. But I appreciate you and bringing the information to us me. and bringing um, the information to the residents. So if there are no questions for Dr. Bruce, I'd like to make a motion to um, send this favor favorably back to the full city council. Okay, the motion's been made and properly seconded all in favor. All opposed? Thank you. All Thank you, again, it passes. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Madam Clerk. Six, resolved by the Brockton City Council to invite Mayor Robert Sullivan and Patrick Hill, Commissioner of Public Works, to come before the City Council to discuss plans for road paving and other infrastructure work. Invited Robert Sullivan, Mayor, Patrick Hill, Commissioner of DPW. Good evening, Commissioner. Good evening, Councilors. 
Uh, so I think I'll just give you a brief as to where we stand today, um, just to kind of give an explanation as to why we didn't pave last year. Um, the 2021 paving season was pretty extensive. Generally speaking, we rolled money over to start the next paving year. We did not do that. We uh, paved extensively in 2021 when the um, Chapter 90 money was released in May. Uh, the uh, contract that we had with our current paving contractor or the paving contractor at the time was due to expire in July. I was only able to get two streets uh, paved last year based on that. I put the contract back out and based on a quantity issue, the RFP had to go back out again. Um, th that, that contract came back at the end of August. It was returned to us. We sent it to the contractor. It was returned to us at the end of September. By the time I was able to get all the signatures on the contract, I wasn't able to get on the paving, uh, in, paving in time next year, or last year. So um, that's why we didn't get as much pave as we generally do. Um, the new contract uh, is, has the, the costs have increased considerably, um, 30 to 40 percent on average. I, I can give you a kind of a breakdown, and, uh, and, I, and I will do that on a couple of streets um, that we have calculated for this year. Um, I've also engaged with uh, Beta Engineering, which is a consulting firm that is used um, across the Commonwealth. And my hope is to create a pavement management program. Um, not only will it look at the way that we pave, but it'll, it'll look into restoring pavement preservation. Uh, the city hasn't done any kind of pavement preservation since 2010. And what pavement preservation would entail would be, you know, crack sealing, microsurfacing, fog sealing, cape sealing, uh, cold in place recycling, diff different technologies that we haven't used for a long, long time. Uh, currently, the city has 276 miles of road. Um, the average PCI, which is the pavement condition index, which is how they score the streets, um, is 58. Since this data has been collected, um, since 2017, we've been kind of stagnant right, right around between 61, 60. Uh, it's at 58 right now based on the fact that we didn't pave last season. If we were to restore all the roads based on today's contract value, according to the program, that it would be about $200 million. We also have uh, 154 miles of sidewalk. Uh, I know we, we get a lot of complaints about sidewalk. We don't always restore sidewalks when we do paving. To restore all the sidewalk in the city of Brockton, based on its condition today, would be $53 million. So a grand total between streets and sidewalks, uh, uh, $245 million to restore everything to get it up to uh, between a 90 and 100 P, uh, PSI, or PCI, I'm sorry. So my goal is to, to create a, a pavement um, management program based off of you know the data that we collected in 2021. Um, what that will do was give us a five-year uh, outlook as to you know recommendations that are uh, based off of the data that's been collected, um, and it will uh, encompass a, a pavement preservation program. This year, uh, we plan to start paving in April. I have taken requests from most of you. Um, currently in uh, Chapter 90, we have $2.1 million. We have $819,000 in winter recovery assistance money that came from the state last year. We have $206,000 in the water street repair line item in our budget, and we have $346,000 in our highway paving. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Answer, Rodriguez. Uh, just a quick question, Madam Chair. Um, Commissioner, What's the life expectancy of a road, let's say a road that doesn't get touched for, you know, the gas and water cutting that actually takes place? How long is a, a, the average road good for, do you know? Years ago, it was about 15 years if a road was not touched um, because the, you know, it, it, we, we no longer sand roads, we salt roads and the salt deteriorates the roads pretty quickly. And with no preservation, if a road were to be left untouched, typically about 12 years. 
So technically, every 12 years, you got to redo a road in a Correct. sense. Correct. And you said 200 and. Fifty something million dollars, right? Two hundred forty-five million dollars to do them all. Yeah, what's well, an extra, you know, five million dollars among friends? And and the and pavement preservation will probably be five to ten percent of the uh, the average paving budget per year, but pavement preservation should bring us out of that sixty sixty one PCI and start reeling us back in so that the pavement will last longer. So roads that get paved, you know. This year in four years should be retreated to extend the light. And do you have a do you happen to have a list of uh, road roads that are prioritized in the sense from worse to not so worse? I do. <coughs> Is there any way you can make a copy and somehow get us? A, it's a very a difficult program to make a copy of. Um, I I could send you the data. Uh, it's very difficult to navigate through. Um, I mean, just the name. To... Basically, this. You know, Summer Street, Worst Street in Brockton, you know, Main Street, second worst, that kind of stuff. Yeah, I could do that. And I don't mean Summer Street's the worst street. I'm just saying, you know, <laughs> since I live on Summer Street, I might as well pick on my own street, you know. It's never going to get repaid. It's not gonna, never going to get repaid, but that's okay. <laughs> so is there any way you can, you can kind of give us that breakdown? I so can. At least, at least, you know, the reason why I'm, a, I'm asking for this is that a lot of times we get calls from uh, constituents that says, a, my, my road hasn't been paved in, you know, 100 years, and yet when you look at it compared to some other roads, it's not as bad in some instances. Uh, but if at least we had, uh, you know, the knowledge that, you know, here's the, here's the priority of what we think, or at least the city thinks there are bad roads or bad streets, that at least it would kind of ease that pain in explaining those situations to uh, our residents. Yeah, and you know, Councillor, I think that you know after this uh, pavement management program gets established, uh, I think it probably at that point where it will you know have a five-year lookout would be appropriate to maybe front-face that data so that the public can see exactly what the condition of their roads are. Yeah. And in that program, it also identifies the streets that are public versus private. So. Uh, I mean, I'm happy to do that once we. Yeah, get whatever information we can share with the uh, with the residents, in the sense, I think it makes the, our jobs a lot easier to say, look, there's a list, and this is the situation that we're all facing. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you, you sir. Madam Chair. Thank you, Councilor Reza. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, good evening, Commissioner. Good evening, so we had a conversation today about our streets. Uh, first of all, thank you for the information, and um, as you know. That's, as counselors, that's the number one call we get is about streets and repaving. So, um, and I've said this many times, we don't get enough money to be able to do all our streets or streets that we hope to get repaved. Um, I know you gave a breakdown, but is there any way that we can advocate or somehow get more funding. Uh, maybe this is a question for our CFO. But the other day, when our governor and lieutenant governor were here, and um, they were they went around um, the city, I was hoping they noticed our how bad some of our streets needed to be repaired. So I was hoping somehow they could send us more funding. But um, I mean, besides them actually seeing it, is what can we do? Is there anything we can do to get more funding for um, paving? I would only say that the state legislator um, con controls, I believe, the Chapter 90 program and how the money is allocated. Uh, you know, every year there's discussion as to more funding going into that program through the governor's budget. Uh, there were f a few rumors this year that it, it might possibly double from 200 to 400 million dollars. Okay. Um, and from what I can determine, anyway, it looks as though that we're, it's it's going to be level funded this year and the money will be released early next year, but there won't be any additional funding. No additional funding? No. So it didn't help that they saw how bad our streets were? <laughs> um, so no, I don't mean, I just, it's just crazy because I think people forget what a large city we are and how many um, agencies we, we service for our surrounding towns. And I mean, we spoke about Reynolds Highway from Pleasant Street to the, um, you know, in the mall and it's just, it's awful. And um, that is state funded. We did, um, so I already spoke to Senator Brady about it. I put a bug in his ear. I'm like, we have to get this done. So, I mean, whatever we can do on our end, if, if there is anything we can do, just know that that's 
we're here, just like we spoke earlier to the, um, you know, for the sports. I think that it's one of our biggest problems is our streets. So if there's any way we can get more funding, whoa. Uh, yeah, and I'm not aware of it. I know the BIL, um, the, the way the BIL funding worked, it funded a lot of these DOTs, mass DOTs, um, the districts. Um, how they're using that funding, I do not know. Um, I would think that at some point they'll be doing a little bit more aggressive paving, but uh, it certainly hasn't affected the TIP schedule much, so okay, I, I can't thank say. you. Well, the pavement management program sounds like something that would be very helpful, a lot, which is great, so I'm happy to hear that. But thank you again for all you do. Thank you, Councilor. Thank you, thank you Madam Chair. You're welcome. Councilor Farwell. Thank you, Madam Chair. Commissioner, do we issue a lot of street opening permits? If we, we do. We do. Okay, one of the things that's always bothered me is that we don't charge the utility or the company that's opening up the street on a per square foot basis to return the street to where it should be. And it, obviously, that if we do have an ordinance, it should reflect the cost per square foot now. So uh, I haven't looked at that in a long while. I understand for whatever reason the gas company was exempt, but. National Grid or some other company came in, I, I do believe we charge a fee, but I'd like to kind of explore an updated ordinance that would require that individual corporation that is opening up a street for, you know, two feet wide times 100 feet, 200 square feet, they should be compensating us for having someone go out and inspect the work that's being done and make sure that it's done to the standards that you and the city expect, and I, I'd just like you to think about that. I don't need, uh, I don't need an answer uh, tonight. No, I actually I think it's a great idea, and I don't see why we could not um, in increase the dollar value of the permit to, to kind of you know capture some of those costs because we we need more inspectors out on the road, and you know the gas company they come in they they do a lot of work. They're regulated by the DPU. Their rest, uh, restoration is, is regulated by the DPU. They're only obligated to do so much. Um, I, I don't see why we couldn't make it stronger here in the city with an ordinance, but I'm, I'm happy to have those discussions. By the way, do we require a bond? Do they have to post a bond? They all they... have to post. They, they all post bonds, yeah. They do? Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you, Madam Chair. You're welcome. Um, Councilor Texera. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, uh, Commission. You said we've got 58 miles of street that you're going to be paving this year, correct? No, the, the average PCI of, of the streets here in the city today is 58. Oh, it's 58. It's 58, based on a scale of 1 to 100. I, I expect that to be right around 61 after the spring paving. Um, but we've been kind of stagnant in that since we started collecting the data in 2017. But do you have an idea which ward that will be? Because, you know, maybe Ward 3 needs more attention than Ward 1. I, I would only say this, that the, the way that the pavement management program will be developed, it will be to put into consideration all the wards. Um, there are enough streets in tough condition where I think that, you know, it's, it's important for each ward to get uh, a little bit of paving. Uh, if the program actually kind of breaks down how much restoration would cost if you were to go in and do, let's just say, the in entire, you know, Ward 6. And <coughs> please do. <laughs> ward 6 may be very costly to restore um, because it's mostly reconstruction. And when I say it's mostly reconstruction, they have to, come, they have to go in and completely rebuild the roads. Whereas, you know, maybe in Ward 4, you know, they could, they could get away with, with a lot of milling. And a milling, is, you know, tends to be about a third cheaper. So, um, you know, the, the pavement program will put, or the, the, any kind of pavement management program that we put together will we'll consider the entire city um, and not just nail down necessarily the worst streets. Uh, it'll be, you know, all seven wards will, will be considered and, and it'll be, the goal will be to, to try to bring that PCI up. Uh, to a higher level a little bit every year. So when you do the paving also, do you, do you, do you replace the pipe like the... Uh, I would love to sit here and say that, that we replace the pipes on every street before we pave them. Um, right now we do not. Uh, I know that, you know, next year or this year we're going to be starting a, a, a substantial project on, on North Main Street, 
where we're going to be putting a water main in, you know, from, from Battle Street all the way to the Avon line. Uh, we're going to be running a pipe down Wilder Street and a portion of North Montella Street. Because of that, you know, that entire two and a half mile stretch will get paved. But, uh, you know, pipe, pipes have become very costly. And, you know, when I say pavement has gone up 30%, the cost of pipes has gone up 40%. So I, I would love to put a new pipe in every road, a new water pipe, you know, a, new, you know, a, a newly lined sewer pipe, which we try to do anyway. Um, new drainage, which, you know, hopefully with a stormwater fund we'll be able to start tackling. But it's very, very expensive, and until I think we get our feet off the ground here a little bit, uh, it's going to be a little while before we can do that. So it's like the, doing double the work, though. You know, you go and pave, then you come back and do the pipes. Yeah, it's, it's frustrating, but, yeah, we, we, it's going to have to happen like that, unfortunately. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Councilor Lally. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, the... Uh, both, both the the quality of the roads and the quality of the pipes is a is a big, big issue that you know we're grappling with, especially up in my area. Um, a couple of times actually, uh, we've had roads that we were looking to get paved that had to be held off a year or two because we didn't have the matching money necessary to handle the piping underneath it. Uh, simply because it just you know they were both so bad. Uh, they they had to wait, and I'm I'm not kidding. If you want to do all the ward, it would be very expensive, but but it'd be very appreciated. Um, you know the the pavement management program I think is is encouraging, um, and you know I'm usually one to to be right out there lobbying that, you know the ward councilors advocate for their streets, and I don't think that changes, but I do think that. Um, you know, I'm, I'm happy to put my, my statistics where my mouth is and, you know, the data being used to determine the roads that are in, in the worst shape, I think will, uh, confirm both what, you know, what, what I've been saying about, about these roads and, um, you know, what, what the folks at home have been saying. Um, I know Councillor Farwell made a, a very good point about permits, fees, fines, things like that, and, and Councillor Rodriguez and I have had, uh, a, Quite a few conversations about how a lot of these are dated um, and old and could be you know upgraded and be sort of still be competitive with other communities um, and I've, I've, I've brought this up as well uh, but I, I want to get your thoughts on it um, a, a constituent brought an idea to me to have some sort of system like they do in, in other large cities with uh, some kind of some kind of coin or stamp, so if Eversource does some work on a street and then they fix it, they they pave over it, they patch it, uh, they have to put some kind of stamp indicating who did it into the road. So if we do have a problem with the quality of work in some areas, we can find out exactly who's responsible for that very quickly, and you know issue some kind of penalty or response. I want to get your, your thoughts on it. I know I'm just dropping it on you, but... I, I mean, I would say, you know, based on technology that, especially we've, we've, we've you know, come very far with our GIS program. We just got a GIS coordinator uh, within the past year here. All the permits will be put into a GIS system. So, you know, if, if somebody's questioning as to, you know, whether or not or who did the work, what utility did the work on a street, it, it should be pretty easily identifiable now. Yeah. Um, because all the permits should be going directly into uh, the GIS system. Which is good. But, yeah, we want to make sure that, you know, somebody's get, not getting away with, you know, half-hearting half it. Um, but, no, that's, that's important. Um, I wanted to transition a little so that this, you know, touches on other infrastructure work. Um, and we did go briefly into pipes. Um, but, you know, other things on our horizon... Uh, we have some things that are, some deadlines that, that we're, you know, beginning to stare right in the face. Um, you know, I didn't know if you'd be able to shed any more light on what, we, what we've been talking about or looking at uh, with the potential for a, a sludge dryer or some other answer to uh, the, the potential that the Naugatuck plant in Connecticut may be closing. So what I can tell you for sure, Councillor, is that... Um, I have had some discussions with an outside engineering firm um, 
on a consulting basis to review an RFEI that was submitted uh, for the sludge dryer. Um, and basically that just is, a, you know, a bunch of random technologies um, and a bunch of ran uh, random engineering proposals for the sludge drying facility um, down at the sewer plant. Um, we, we intend to, you know, close that out and, and progress into an RFP. Um, the RFP will be, you know, for a engineering firm or, um, or an engineering firm in some form of technology to review proposals to, to deal with the biosolids issue. Um, the concern is right now based on the, you know, the cost per ton um, for disposal and where the market already is and where the market is going to be upon expiration of our contract um, in December of this year. And I will tell you that the, this, this firm that we have had the brief discussions with has been reviewing these for other communities. And that $145 a ton biosolids disposal cost right now in the market is about $296. Um, Which would free up more sewer money to do more sewer pipes. Stop it. What do you know? Uh, so we will be using the $2 million AMR to, to progress, um, to get an RFP out there to, to, to start looking at a, a solution to deal with the biosolids on the plant. So. Well, fair enough. Um, I know we have you know, a couple other, couple other things in the pipeline that are ongoing, uh, and I know that I've worked extensively with, with you and, and Mr. CFO on some of, the, some of the other ways to try and, you know, free up some money. Um, would you be able to give any sort of update or any sort of information on, on desal, or is that something that we're not brave enough to get into tonight? And so we're <laughs> no. kind of outside of the, the scope of our resolve. Well, this, this touches infrastructure work. Does it? Yeah. Well, it's, it's part of our infrastructure, and by, you know, whatever actions are taken here, uh, we can, um, you know, possibly free up more money for other things. But in, in the interests of, of time, I will, uh, I, will, I will hold off on that for now. My God. But that's, that's all I've got. Thank, Thank you. you. Councilor D'Agostino. Well, thank you for being here. <laughs> um, <clears throat> So a couple questions. Uh, the first one, you and I have talked quite a bit about paving and the cost of paving and how it's gone up. Um, and we had talked a little bit more than several times about there were some um, alternative paving systems or options out there. Can you talk a little bit about that and pros, cons? What are we exploring? So a lot of that stuff is, is preservation related um, there is a, um, a a repair uh, that's called cold in place recycling um, we don't we're not under contract for that but I, I will say that that you know we are a part of a group called the Southeastern Regional Services Group we are allowed to procure our uh, services through that contract they do have a company um, that does do cold in place, uh, place recycling, and that is uh, in place of total restoration. Um, it's, it's expensive. I don't think it's as expensive. I really haven't had an opportunity to really dig into it. I am going on um, a, a trip down to Rhode Island to, to, to view it as actively as it's being put down by a company called Indus. Um, Indus is the company that actually um, the Southeastern Regional Services Group has an award with. Um, but other than, you know, like I, I wouldn't want to say one way or another if that's something that we'll be doing in the future until I see it done. So Right. Okay. And wasn't there some kind of, I don't remember exactly what, the, I'm going to mess this up when I describe it, but I thought there was some other thing that some of the towns around us had tried that was a rubberized something or other. So it's, it's microsurfacing. Um, they've done it quite a bit in East Bridgewater. A uh, company comes in, they apply a very s small layer of um, almost like a, uh, I don't want to call it an epoxy, but a, a sealer, a heavy sealer. Um, it does 
extend the life of a road about six to seven years. There are there is a threshold for the road. The road has to be a certain PCI for that application to to happen. That application uh, is limited to like 120 days. So if you're not on the um, list already this year, then you're going to have to wait till next year, kind of thing. Gotcha. Um, that's also uh, uh, a technology that I could use through the Southeastern Regional Services Group contract. Um, but to get moving on this year's paving, I'm, I'm you know, we're going to be using our uh, Chapter 90 contract with uh, TL Edwards. Right, right. And, and I just want to say, because I, I appreciate that you've been out there looking at alternative solutions, and uh, so I, I applaud that. Um, because the reality is you've got roughly $4 million to work with, and honestly, we both know I could burn through that in Ward 3, no problem, I mean, like that. And every ward councilor could burn through $4 million, you know, in paving, you know, in a minute. I mean, I would expect this year, because this, you know, the money that, that I did tell you about does not include this year's Chapter 90 allotment, which we expect in May. Okay. So this year... Realistically, we could be doing almost $5 million worth of paving. Right. Which would be great, and we certainly need it. And, um, you know, so like I said, I, I just wanted to give credit where it's due because I think it's a good thing that you're looking at alternatives to try to stretch that money, whether it's four or five or however many millions of dollars it is, as far as we can because we have so much that needs to be done, you know. Well, and it's, it's, a, it's a better, better long-term investment, too, right, to, to, to get back in the preservation business. I mean, you know, the PCI, what the PCI tells us, you know, is that we're stagnant. And I think it would, you know, behoove everybody here in the city to, to have the roads slowly start progressing in a positive direction. Right. Absolutely. Um, and then can you just, I know we've, we've talked about this, and I understand it, but maybe not everybody... Um, does who's who might watch this what determines whether you have to whether you can just mill a road or whether you have to do a full rebuild basically the subsurface so a lot of you know I'll use Campanelli roads a lot of Campanelli roads were paved with probably two inches of pavement you know one inch of a binder and possibly one inch of top um, when a machine a machine of the size of a, a reclamation machine comes in it would go right through the pavement so they, they, they look at the subsurface, they determine the thickness of the pavement, and if a, if a road can be milled, it, we, we generally do mill them. Um, but when you get into, you know, a lot of the Campanelli streets, those, those roads are just two inches thick or an inch and a half thick, um, and it requires a total restoration. All the asphalt has to come out, all the subsurface has to come out, the road has to be, um, you know, the gravel has to be put down and graded, all the structures need to be raised and, um, just becomes very expensive. Right, right. How, how thick should a properly built road be? We say four inches. Uh, I think Mass DOT standard is six inches. Um, but generally speaking, we do four inches. Okay. All right. Um, and then, you know, again, on the, on the topic of the utilities, and so uh, are they subject to our ordinances? How, I mean, they're regulated by the DPU, but uh, they're subject to our local ordinances? So the pavement restoration for a private utility is based off the DPU um, and and that's in the research that I've done right so um, I don't know that we could hold them to a different standard um, but I don't know that we couldn't either and it certainly I think if we could cater an ordinance to kind of capture some of that stuff because you know drive down Forest Ave right now and if you haven't driven down Forest Ave um, it, it doesn't look pretty and, and, and the gas company will come in and repave the sections of the road that they've done. Um, and they'll do it, you know, 18 inches on either side of their trench and the trenches that go across the street. But no matter what they do, the street doesn't look the same as when they got there. So right. um, Hillberg Ave, you know, they, we, we, we repaved the road. Um, the gas company went in there based on their regulations. They're obligated to replace so much pipe every year. We had them restore the road completely, but it doesn't look like the road that was there that they ripped up. So right. I don't want to say they use subpar contractors. I'm just, you know, we, we're very fortunate to have TL Edwards. They're, they do very, very good work. Um, but it's difficult to kind of see when stuff like that happens. Well, yeah, and I think that really annoys people because they see their tax dollars just repaved Hilberg, for, to use that example. And great, the gas company's replacing pipes. That's a good thing. We want that. 
but they just tore up a brand new road. They fixed it, but not the same way that it was. There's, not, there's nothing more frustrating than seeing a brand new road ripped up. Right. And we've seen it the day after it gets paid, so. Right, which is just, I mean, how does that, how does that happen? Like, is there not better coordination? Is there, what is, I don't know, how does that happen? <sighs> I don't want to say there isn't better, you know, we're, we're, we're working on, you know, our communication with the, with the outside utilities. I'm hoping with this new program that with a five-year outlook, we'll have the ability to get these, you know, uh, these national grids, these, you know, this uh, Eversource uh, into these roads before we have to pave them. Um, especially having a five-year outlook, we can kind of cater our plans or that we can cater their plans to ours. Um, but coordination is difficult with utilities, especially the, with the gas company having all the issues that they've had. Their priorities are based off of, you know, age of pipes. So right. um, we do have discussions with them, but it's, 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 it's not always 100% uh, that uh, we're going to get what we want. So. Yeah, no, I get that. It would just, it, and, I, and I'm sure you're doing the best you can, and, and they are probably sometimes good to work with and sometimes not so much. I'm sure it depends on the situation. It'd just be better if there was, and maybe this is something that we need some state help with to, I don't know, have some way to be able to, hey, we're, gonna, we're thinking of repaving Trabu Street. Do you guys need to put any pipes in there while we got it open? You know, um, rather than we do it and the next year they're there tearing it apart, you know? Yeah, and you know, like, you know, with the, even with the public safety building, I know that we're, you know, we're, we sent that message, you know, if you guys have, you know, infrastructure work that you're going to have to do, it has to be done because once that building opens, yeah. um, you know, there, there is no going in the road and tying up traffic there. So right. Right. we sent that message. It's okay on a project like that. We don't often get that much time uh, right. or have that much outlook. So. Okay. All right. Thank you. And then just one other thing I wanted to, um, my colleague from Ward 6 brought up the um, issue of biosolids. And so I... I Thought it would be wouldn't be a terrible idea if you could talk a little bit about you know you talked about a dryer, and then I think a lot of times people think of incineration and how are they different a dryer versus an incinerator and I know there's no good answer to how we deal with biosolids I mean think about what it is there's no pleasant way to deal no good way to deal with that but um, so I know that's a lengthy discussion but just the difference in the two because that's kind of I've heard some feedback that some folks think that the dryer is basically an incinerator by another name. No. So, the, I mean, the, just in real brief, the, I mean, the dryer is basically like a big pizza oven. What it does is reduce the amount of um, liquid that is in the biosolid down to about 10%. Um, it, it's a very low heat. Um, it, it, it has little to no emissions. Um, an incinerator runs at a very high heat and, and destroys uh, biosolids and reduces it to ash. Um, the mayor has already committed that, that there will certainly be no incinerator ever in the city. So, right. not under not under his watch anyway. So, right, right. No, and I, I don't think I, I, we don't have a place far enough from residences for a incinerator, in my opinion. I mean, um, but that's why I wanted to get some clarification. I know we've talked a lot about that. So. All right, thank you. That's all I have. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Councilor Farwell. Thank you. I missed a couple of things on the first go around. Obviously, we don't have the money to repair sidewalks, but cutting back brush, keeping the sidewalks free so that at least they are handicapped accessible and people don't have shrubs and bushes and grass growing, especially grass along the side of the road between the curbing and the street, it, it just makes the city look you know, not the way I would like to see it. And, and, and last year was a very, very bad year with a drought for grass on the sidewalks. You know, the highway department spent a significant amount of time out there weed whacking a lot of the areas. Um, we are looking into doing an application or several applications throughout the year to prevent grass from growing up in the sidewalks because it's not a good look and it's very difficult to deal with. Um, we're putting something together right now to get an RFP out to kind of address that this spring. Um, right. You know, and the, it, it's it, when they go in and they, you know, and they pave roads. When we, you know, and even if we do not do the sidewalks, anything that needs to be, you know, 
um, brought up to standard to be ADA compliant, whether it be the handicap ramps or anything that like that gets restored during the paving process. All right. The other thing I would say about um, the utilities, we used to get, when I was in the mayor's office, we gave a six month notice that we were going to do the following streets, go in and do your utility work. If they didn't do it, we don't give them a permit, unless it's an emergency. Now, if someone clearly has an emergency, electrical uh, or, or gas or something, yes, you have to open up the street. But if they just come in and say, oh, well, we've got a few customers we want to look, link up, I mean, I wouldn't ruin the street, frankly. I, I think, don't we have a three or five year? Moratorium. Moratorium. We haven't really enforced moratoriums in, at least in the, probably the past 10 years. Um, I don't know with the DPU putting a consent order on uh, the gas company, if we could hold them to that standard or not, uh, but it'd certainly be worth looking Your into. question for the law department. Yes. The third thing, very quickly, in biosolids, somebody in this commonwealth must have the same problem we do. So there should be a way of determining what is another city doing or what is another group of communities doing to handle biosolids that might be going through a regional treatment plant. And I... I, I really implore you and others to try to research what what are other communities in the Commonwealth doing. We can't be alone in this. Well, Just I will say that a lot of people produce a product that's land applied. Um, land application has been restricted, if not completely eliminated, in the state of Maine. It's coming up in the state of New Hampshire. Uh, and the problem with it is, you know, some, the people were pelletizing, you know, biosolids. Um, and using that as fertilizer. The problem is it's loaded with PFAS. <clears throat> so um, we expect our NIPTES permit, then our next NIPTES permit, which I believe is coming up um, within the next year or two, um, to have some sort of PFAS limit on discharge. So whether it be discharging, you know, what we discharge into the river, what our biosolids look like, um, so a lot of the alternatives that have been used in the past are is not something that we can look at for the future. So, okay. And then just, and I, I say this with, with some degree of humor, but in all seriousness, for those who may be catching Aquaria water fever, it can be a deadly disease. It strikes without warning and somehow takes over people's thinking. I just want everyone to remember, Mass General Laws, Chapter 40, Section 38. A city council by a two-third vote ratified by voters called for an election for that specific purpose can acquire a water source. So if anybody thinks we're going to go Aquaria and anybody thinks it's going to be easy, unless you pass a home rule petition the way this council did years ago, stripping away the voters' rights to vote on that, which I thought was reprehensible, you can't do it. So as we discuss infrastructure, let's also remember that the public has a, way, has a right to weigh in on the purchase of a water source. Uh, Mass General Laws, Chapter 40, Section 38. I live by that section. So thank you. Councillor Farwell. <laughs> Aquaria. Anyway, Councillor Rodriguez. My favorite, my favorite subject, <laughs> Aquaria. Now, uh, Madam Chair, I actually have a, a follow-up question of something that came up in terms of road cutting. Um, Commissioner, when somebody applies for a building permit, you know, through the uh, building department to do whatever they need to do, they'll, they'll issue the permit, and then the work gets done, and then the inspectors go back and check on the work to make sure that it was done properly. And if not, they don't get a, an occupancy permit. So when the, the utility company uh, applies for a permit to open a road, and I'm not talking about a road, you know, the work that was done on Forest Ave. I'm talking about cutting for access to, you know, get mostly gas that they basically cut the road. The rest of it is done by us cutting for water and sewer. But I'm talking about specifically for gas, do we have someone that goes back and check on the work that they do before we say it's okay, move on to the next thing, or they just they apply for a permit, they do the cutting, and then they disappear, whether or not the work is done and done properly or not, then it becomes your problem afterwards. So when streets councilor get done 
Uh, and, and I'll just use Forest Ave not because of it being probably one of the worst streets, but um, the, the paving is done weekly as, as part of the permit. <clears throat> so generally speaking, um, at least once a week, that section of the road gets paved. It does not get finally restored until it's settled out. So we, we allow for six months of settlement before the, the street gets finally paved. We do monitor the streets um, and the project as they get done. We do not release projects until everything has been paved. But, you know, they could pave a street, you know, temporarily pave a street in, in that settlement period of six months. The street may settle. We'll ask them to go back, restore the pavement, or at least patch the pavement to get it, you know, drivable. Um, until the final rest restoration is done. Well, I'm actually specifically talking about the cutting for utilities to residents. You know, for instance, I'm gonna bring up Summer Street again. If you look at Summer Street, it's in decent shape throughout. But when you look around the areas, I mean, even in front of my house, you know, where some cuts were made for some new building that came into play, there's holes now, you know, that are actually uh, accumulating over the years in the sense because of that cutting wasn't done, I mean, the patching of the cut wasn't done the way it should have been done, that you've got a decent road that could probably put up with another few, a couple of years, but yet because of the cutting and the way they patched it up, it kind of looks pretty, as Council Fowler was saying, pretty crappy, you know? And, and, that, and that pavement restoration is only good for, so they're only responsible for it for a year. Well, that's, but the, see, that's the reason why I'm saying this. Do we have somebody, for instance, again, on Summer Street, they applied for a permit to give me utilities. We have somebody from the city that goes back and says, it looks good, you know, on your way? Yes. Or do they basically just, as soon as they're done, they pack up their equipment and move on? We, we send our uh, civil engineers out when they do their paving, their, their final restoration, um, to inspect. Because some of them, I'm telling you right now, there's some decent patches that you see out there, but there's some other ones that are pretty crappy looking. And you know it's only a matter of time become, before the potholes show up. You know, so that's why I was, I was bringing that up because it's, it, it, it's like that throughout the city. But it's not necessarily, I'm not necessarily talking about, you know, uh, Foster, uh, Forest Ave. I'm talking about those, just those little in general. You know, cuts that you see throughout. And they just, again, it, in my opinion, it destroys the whole road because the road itself is not that bad, but yet you've got these, you know, potholes all over the place because of... Uh, you know, these cuts that they're doing. So you're talking about like individual utility trenches yeah, as opposed yeah. to being part of an entire project. Sorry, I, I, you... I know that we do go out and, and um, look at those, Councillor. Um, I mean, when you get a I, chance. I'm not going to sit here and say that, but they, that a few of them probably have, haven't have slipped through the cracks. Uh, we only have two civil engineers up there right now. Currently, but when you get a so. chance, swing by, for instance, Summer Street right in front of my house and you see what I'm talking about. Will do. All right. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Madam Chair. And that's when you're, uh, it's in your ward, by the way, Madam Chair. I know that. <laughs> Just kidding. And, and, and related issues in my ward. Uh, Commissioner Hill, you've, in one of our many conversations about roads and infrastructure, you've told me that there were a number of roads that were opened by the utilities last year that weren't completely filled in or covered over top coats by the utilities. I'm thinking of Pine Avenue, but there are others too. Um, they'll be coming back? So they're, they're, we're waiting on their final paving schedule. Um, we had a discussion with them last week. Um, they will be providing us with some start dates for paving. It looks like uh, mid-April. And this is all over the city? This is all over the city. Any, right. any place that they have any of those larger scale projects, whether it be um, Center Street, Pine Ave, uh, Nelson Street, um, there's a pretty substantial amount on the east side. I'm, I, I'm not going to sit here and give you all the streets, but okay. th there is a pretty substantial um, portion of streets that have to be redone this year. So. And your office tracks this, tracks it. To <coughs> as, soon as, as soon as we get the paving list, we'll, we will post it and send it out to everyone. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Councilors? Motion to recommend favorably back to the full city council. Second. Motion's been made and properly seconded. All in favor? Opposed? Thank you. Motion carries. Thank, Thank you, Council. Uh, Madam Clerk. Resolve, <clears throat> whereas the City of Brockton 
was required to, and the City Council did adopt on December 22nd, 2019, the Stormwater Control Ordinances, Revised Ordinance Section 23-131. To comply with the Stormwater Program of the National Pollutant Discharge and Malignation System promulgated by the U.S. Department of Environmental Protection, and whereas the purpose of said ordinances is to affect proper management of stormwater runoff and its control facilities in a prudent manner to comply with state and federal environmental regulations. And whereas said ordinances provide at section 23-132 and 135 for the imposition of a stormwater utility fee to fund stormwater services and payable into a special dedicated fund. Whereas said fee is intended as stated in section 23-135 to be operated in the manner the existing sewer and water utilities are operated. And whereas since the city began billing property owners for said stormwater utility fee, there have been repeated problems with the billings, including inaccuracies and duplicate billings and how the bills are calculated, as well as a need to clarify the amounts being raised. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Brockton City Council to invite Commissioner of Public Works, Patrick Hill, the Treasure Collector, Martin Brothy, and CFO <coughs> Troy Clarkson to appear before the Finance Committee of the Brockton City Council to discuss billing issues and such other related issues as may arise. By separate resolve, the members of the Stormwater Authority will be invited to discuss the uses of the funds raised and other related issues. Invited Mayor Robert Sullivan, Mayor Patrick Hill, Commissioner of DPW, Martin Brophy, Treasurer Collector, Troy Clarkson, Chief Financial Officer. Gentlemen, good evening. <coughs> good evening, Madam Chairman. Why don't I give a brief introduction and then Commissioner Hill can certainly speak to some of the technical aspects uh, of the, the stormwater program and its billing. One of the things that uh, we have realized as a group, including Commissioner Hill and Treasurer Collector Marty Brophy, our auditor, uh, we met together some time ago uh, and realized that uh, the billing for property taxes and excise taxes sort of occurred in a silo and the billing for water and sewer and now stormwater occurred parallel to, but in its own silo. So we are developing a more comprehensive approach. Uh, this isn't gonna solve the issues that exist and the ones we're here to discuss tonight, but I do believe uh, that by collaborating and actually unifying our efforts <coughs> under one umbrella, to utilize our collective skills for all of the billing that we will prevent some of uh, the issues that have occurred both in confusion with the public, uh, some glitches in munis that we can talk about, uh, and just an overall lack of coordination. And so Marty Brophy has put together this schedule that Pat and Karen and I and others have reviewed uh, and this is just, this is not a panacea, let me be clear, but it is a piece of the puzzle to try to streamline what we do so that we can publicize this, share it with the public, they'll understand uh, when the payments are gonna be due and how. Uh, most particularly in this scenario, the stormwater billing will occur once a year for the entire amount that's due. Um, and I think that that sets the stage for our discussion tonight. So we understand that there have been problems and there have been issues. We're trying to, to correct them and to create a system, most importantly, that's easier for our taxpayers to understand and address. Specifically, as it relates to stormwater, uh, we have provided you with an update as of today. Uh, our projections for this year for stormwater revenue were that we would bring in approximately $800,000 
To date, we've collected about 70% of that, so we're a little ahead uh, as to where we should be, but, but pretty close. So we've collected about $561,000. As all of you know painfully well, there is a bill that's out there right now, so we, uh, we do believe that those collections will continue and that we will meet that revenue goal for the year. Uh, we're putting together our budgets, as you know, for next year, and soon we'll share with you all of the budgets for fiscal year 24. Uh, and we do believe that the, the stormwater budget will be more robust for next year because of the money that's now coming in. We have a sense of what we're able to spend, and so we'll begin to be able to talk about some of those projects that, that Pat talked about earlier, uh, about using some of that stormwater money, both for ongoing projects uh, for increased drainage, which does have paving associated with it. And also looking at uh, major initiatives down the road, because like with any utility revenue, that stormwater money can be used to support debt uh, that can support some larger projects. So that's uh, just by way of introduction uh, from the, the 30,000 foot level where we're at, and I'm happy to, uh, to defer to Pat for some more specifics and of course, Marty is here as well to discuss that billing schedule should you have any questions. <clears throat> so, uh, I mean, I understand um, with this last round of billing, the level of confusion that was, I guess, set out to the public. Um, and, you know, the, the, the basic theory behind the billing, the way that we did it this time was to kind of pause, to look back, you know, a lot of the complaints that we got in the initial round of the first round of actual billing when, when we separated the bill um, in July kind of were based around the fees that were associated with making a payment of $6. So internally, we had a discussion about the best approach going forward. Um, the the end-all of that discussion was that we would do this once a year. Um, we would do it in July, um, which left three quarters in this fiscal year to bill for. We decided that the middle quarter would be the most appropriate um, so that people kind of felt like they weren't paying the bill twice. Uh, the bill was sent out, it was on the back of the bill explaining the three quarters that were being billed for, and people were given 90 days to make the payments. I, this is my first round in, you know, with, in, the, in the billing world, I guess. Um, you know, there were things that probably should have stood out to me. They did not. Um, opening that door for 90 days and making payments brought a level of confusion with the balances on people's uh, bills. So, you know, they, they were seeing their utility bills. They were seeing, you know, the, the stormwater fee, which was, was shown as late and then the totals did not add up. I, I apologize for the confusion. I, I really think the easiest way for people to get through that is to just call the DPW. Uh, I debated on putting uh, something out to the public. I don't think it would ever have addressed everybody's concerns. It's, it's very hard to reduce that to writing. Um, so I would recommend that if people have issues with these bills now, certainly call the DPW. 508-580-7135, speak to somebody in the DPW and we'll be happy to walk through people's individual problems as they arise. Thank you. Mr. Brophy, any opening comments? Good evening. Well, again, as the commissioner was saying, when a bill is issued, whether, you know, any time a water bill is issued, there could be a pass to a moan on it. If a bill isn't paid, what happens is the amount and paid amount goes into that past due. This one, the, the bills were so close together that that $18, there's no place to sit there and go an additional bill, prior bill. It just lands in that past due amount. And of course, we've been just, as people are calling, explaining, nope, separate bill. It's not past due. It's due May 3rd. Um, and here's your current amount for the water bill. <clears throat> but again, it, it's the <coughs> bill itself, the form of the bill is the form of the bill. The information is just put in. So that $18 since it was issued prior to the water bill, it showed up in that past due. Mm. And there was no interest due on that 
amount if that was all that was passed due. If there happened to have been a real water bill, the prior water bill unpaid, that 18 would have been included in the past due, but there also would have been interest as well. Thank you. Councilor Farwell. Thank you, Madam Chair. As one of the sponsors of this, uh, there are a few things that I want to go over tonight. But first, just for the record, who was on the Stormwater Authority? Who were the individual? So the chairman of the Stormwater Commission um, is the city engineer, uh, Chike. I don't want to butcher his last name. I believe it's Oda Nukwe. Um, Evan Lacasse is a representative from the city that was the mayor's appointee. Um, we have a, uh, one of our foremen down at the highway department uh, and our GIS technician, as well as the, um, uh, why am I forgetting, uh, <coughs> Megan Shave was the, what was Megan's position? No, I know she's a board of her position. I can't think of it off the top of my head. The conservation agent is, is a member of it as well. Okay, so the first thing I want to present to my colleagues is that we, we have unwittingly put, I think, some of you in a conflict of interest. We've created an authority. We've given that authority carte blanche to set up permit fees, set up fees that will be charged for uh, stormwater activities, but they're all city employees. We don't have any civilians on that stormwater authority. We do on the parking authority. We do on the conservation commission. We do on the license commission. All of the different other regulatory boards that set policy for the city and establish fees have civilian appointees. We've taken all municipal government employees and especially if one is a union foreman, they have a vested interest in the money that comes in. The other thing I want to mention to all of you is that we're not just talking about these minor fees that are going out to uh, residents. If we're going to a single bill for the year, don't we have some areas that are paying thousands of dollars? They're going to get a bill that's for thousands of dollars and it has to be paid within a certain period of time? That's correct, Council. Okay. And the fees that you've set, and I just quickly looked at the permit application online, there's one of them here that really intrigues me. Area of ponds slash infiltration system, $100 a square foot. Now, we, we talk about economic development in this city, and we talk about how important it is to make Brockton business friendly. The way I read this is if you had a 20 by 20 pond, a 400 square foot pond, you would owe $40,000 for a fee? I honestly couldn't answer that question right here, Councillor. I, I think that would be probably better answered by the city engineer. Um, he well, did, did develop the stormwater ordinance. I'm not questioning whether or not you're No, I mean, I, I, it's, I just, it's, it's, right from, it's right from the city website. And it says, area of ponds slash infiltration system $100 a square foot, and unless my math is off, 400 square feet would be $40,000 we would charge a developer. And the reason I mention this is that we recently lost a business up on Mill Street, or I think it's Liberty Manly Street, Diesel Direct, because they had invested a lot of money in permits and reviews, etc. And then I guess they got hit with some additional fees. And I just think we've got to step back. I mean, we're, we're folks, if we're business friendly and we want to be serious about what we're doing in this city, then I'm not sure giving businesses a bill for thousands of dollars and giving them a month to pay it is the way to go. And what's very interesting is the mall, which has a lot of vehicular traffic, obviously you're going to have gasoline, diesel, rubber residue that's going to be on the pavement. Yes, that gets washed into the stormwater system. But if you <coughs> took another parking lot, like the one down in Ward 4, that has very little activity because of the, the supermarket is closed, they're going to pay the same amount per square foot, correct? That's For correct. Impervious? It's based on impervious. That's okay, correct. Okay, so it doesn't even factor in use. It just takes the square footage times whatever the fee is. And again, these fees were set by people who have absolutely 
no civilian input or no guidance from business people or residents to perhaps say, wait a minute, folks, we, we need to consider this. The other thing that, and we're not going to solve this tonight, and, I, I, and I'm going to defer to others in a minute, but when this issue first came up, and I think it was because of billing, I wrote to the council president in the city of Taunton because I thought, okay, they're, they're not far away. They've got their paving issues. They've got their EPA and stormwater issues. And I asked, would you be kind enough to share what action the Taunton City Council may have taken in this area, meaning the area of stormwater fees? Additional appropriation to the DPW, question mark. Enter enterprise fund containing stormwater management fees imposed on residents and businesses, question mark. Any other initiatives? And Council President, I don't know if he still is, Council President Philip Duart responded on August 3rd, 2022 at 2.04 p.m. and he said, quote, Councillor Farwell, thank you for reaching out and apologies for the delay in getting back to you. We too have a stormwater management ordinance. We do not have a dedicated fund for stormwater management. Expenses are paid through the DPW's budget. For example, last year, $238,000 was appropriated for construction of new drains. Major projects will now be funded through our new five-year capital improvement plan. And you know, I now regret that I got put under the gun, passed this ordinance, the EPA is breathing down our neck, this is what we've got to do, and here we are. And folks, I, I'm going to offer something uh, later on at a future meeting to tweak this ordinance to, I hope, bring it back into some semblance of, of common sense, being business friendly, emphasize economic development. But, um, and, and by the way, lastly, I don't question uh, Mr. Brophy's comment that if you have a past due bill, it's going to be slid into that water bill. But don't we program that? Doesn't someone have to have to make that decision that? Well, again, it, it would be past due in the system. So, I mean, it basically. It, 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 the problem, Mr. Brophy, was it wasn't past due. It had just come out. Correct. And that's what I said. It, it didn't really have, there was nowhere in the bill else to put it. It landed there because it was issued prior to the bill that came out after it. But, but we've, programmed the, we've programmed the system to do that, correct? It, it was all based on the utility account number. So, again, everything uses the same account number for the water sewer bills. All right, so because we're on the muni system, we don't have a choice, really. We're, we're locked into a it's, format? It's, cut, it's tied to that utility account. Boy, I'll tell you, it, it, it's, it's just so embarrassing in the year 2023 that we can't get a bill right. Uh, and, I, I, and I'm not blaming any one of you, but I'm sure you can see how we feel on the other end of the phone that, Jesus, can't you guys even issue a bill that knows, you know, what's owed and what isn't owed? And I, I don't have an answer for it because I'm not here every day. But, uh, but, but getting back to the stormwater issue, folks, it needs a thorough review. It needs to be done over. I'm not satisfied that we're being fair to everyone with the different charges that are now established by the Stormwater Authority, and I absolutely believe that we should have two or three civilians, residents, that are interested in serving, perhaps with some expertise in accounting or in water man uh, stormwater management uh, on that authority. It shouldn't be all city employees uh, deciding how much revenue we're going to collect and how it's going to be used. Thank you, Madam Chair. You're welcome. Councilor Giagostino. Um, through the chair to my colleague, I, I hope you'll be filing something on this because this has been a, a pain point for a lot of people, you know, so I'm, I'm looking forward to that. I think you just said you were going to, I look forward to that. Um, <laughs> I'm a little frustrated. <laughs> so, uh, unless I misunderstood something, the way it was relayed to me, and maybe I misunderstood it, was... This was a mandate from the EPA. We had to do this. We had to generate revenue that was going to pay for stormwater. Um, I'm not sure what you want to call it, but the, the cost of dealing with stormwater. 
But Taunton doesn't have to? That doesn't make any sense to me. <clears throat> so what I can tell you, Councillor, is this. I, I was not directly involved in the negotiations with the EPA when, when we, the stormwater permit was issued. But what I do know is that when they issue the permit, they require you to either commit to using city funds or establishing um, some form of enterprise with a fee associated to it. They recommend through that process establishing a fee so that the money can be set aside so that the improvements can be made. Um, okay. But it's not, it's not mandated that you set a fee up, it's mandated that you commit to funding and moving forward with, with all the permit requirements. How did we fund our stormwater system prior to this? We never had the, this permit was issued in 2017. Oh. Prior to that, we never, we, the, everything was funded, like uh, Council Fowler said, right through the highway department. Right, so we were maintaining our stormwater systems prior to 2017. It's not like we weren't maintaining our stormwater system. No, not to the level that we're expected to do it now. Um, there is quite a substantial amount of sampling that has to happen through the MS4 permit. Um, that sampling kind of gives you a roadmap as to what has to happen after that. So, you know, uh, investigations into, you know, pipes, uh, IDE, IDDE issues, which is illicit discharge elimination issues. Um, so CCVT work, um, extensive cleaning to identify where those sources come from. Um, you know, there is a certain level of, um, you know, street sweeping that has to happen every year, which we had been doing prior. There's a certain level of catch basin cleaning that has to be done, which um, we had done prior. There are some um, permitting issues that happen during or prior to construction in the tech review process that mandate uh, a certain percentage of the stormwater at any site be captured and naturally discharged into the groundwater system. So there are costs, uh, substantial costs associated with them, um, some of which we intend to capture in this budget this year. You know, the catch basin cleaning, the street sweeping, um, the uh, sampling, um, it, and the goal is to try to use the money to, to get into cleaning some of these uh, drain pipes that haven't been touched in 50, 60 years, to, to start dealing with flooding issues, to start making repairs of catch basins that are crumbling, to uh, look into some of these easements, um, get the proper permitting and clearing these easements that have been left to you know grow for 50 years and are overgrowing into other people's properties. So there is, um, extensive work that has to be done to the stormwater system. And, and I think that, you know, the amount of money or revenue that this is gonna generate will cover most of that, or if not all of that. But it, it is an expensive venture. So, <clears throat> you mentioned that, you know, uh, I guess all, every community, I guess, had an opportunity to negotiate their own arrangement with the EPA, it sounds like. Is that? It's part of the permit, yes. Okay. Are those, are those public record? They are. The permit is a public record. It's, it's posted on the EPA website. And, and I believe it's posted on the city website as well. Right, but the other communities. In other words, can we look at the deals that the other communities, similar communities to Brockton, you know, what did their permit with the EPA require? What did their permit look like with the EPA? I mean, I certainly could look at other communities and see the ones that I know that have permit fees, how their permit looks like. Um, I'm not sure, and I'm not gonna sit here and tell you for sure that right. that's not something that would have to be negotiated with the EPA. It was a permit commitment, I believe, um, but I could certainly look into it. And I, and I, I understand, Taunton Smaller, and it's only one community, maybe they're the only one, maybe there was an exception for some reason, maybe they, I, I don't know. But I'm just starting to wonder a couple of things. First, I, I just like, how did another community, how are they gonna live up to the new standard without doing this? I don't know how they're gonna pull that off if we can't pull that off. 
I, I, I'm going to yield to Mr. Minicello for a minute before he jumps up and down. <laughs> Minicello. I, the, evening, the evening that we discussed this, I pointed out that there was so much discretionary, there was, there was so much discretion in this, whether we chose to, to basically participate in this. There is, no, there is no uniformity between any community with regard to charging for this or, or area, this, this, this regulation, this, this, this monster that the, the federal government is, is trying to impose. What we did as a community, or what was done, is basically we recognized that there is, there is routine maintenance that needs to be done, revenues need to be collected in order to do some of the things that we normally were doing through our regular budget, but it really wasn't enough to get it done. So what did Brockton do? Brockton decided to utilize this tool to basically beef up its, its um, budget in this specific arena, you know, not to use it for, you know, uh, whatever, you know, not to use it for um, the health department, not to use it for whatever, but in this arena to take care of the things that, you know, Mr. Hill is in charge, you know, Commissioner Hill is in charge of it and, and, you know, needs to get done. But it was, it's, it's, a, it's all discretionary. We did not have to jump on board with this in the manner in which we did. We chose to, you know, or, or the, you know the city chose to do this, to, to use this new revenue stream as a way to, you know, beef up those funds, those, um, those um, accounts that are, that are earmarked to do this type of work so that they didn't have to, you know, increase the budgets. You know, this is the new stream of revenue to try and, and, and you know, resolve this stuff, improve this stuff, you know, improve the infrastructure. But, it, but it, there, there's no uniformity between any community. Some communities are doing it, some communities aren't. Some communities are spending more money, some communities aren't. I mean, it, it, it's, it's all up in the air. It, it depends on what the community wants to do. A. B, with regard to the, the billing, um, you know, I got phone call after phone call. People irate because it's like, I pay my bill on time. I pay it, you know, you know, what is this for? Explain to me what this money is for and why is it saying that I'm late? I'm not late. People were offended by it, especially people that are very on, on very fixed incomes, very fixed incomes, the elderly people. A lot of elderly people call me up. You know, they're very, uh, they're very when they get a bill, they pay it right away. And, and to see it that they were late, they were, they were, they were angry. Those bills never should have went out, because I understand what I understand what you know is being told to us. There was no other way or no other place to put it. Then you don't send out a bill like that. You don't. You, you somehow have to before you send out the billing or choose to bill, you have to design a new mechanism to do it accurately, so that the people who are receiving these bills aren't going to see that it's late. It, it, it's, it's a new charge, and really, it should be the building should explain why is this, what is this $18 fee for, so that everyone knows what the heck it's for and what it's going to be used for. You know, it, it was, I get it. I, I understand what the reasoning was. I didn't like it, but I'm, what I'm saying to you is that there is no, there is no, I mean, it's this big federal monster that everyone is using, you know, to basically do the regular maintenance that needs to be done, you know, and, and, and get that money into these particular, you know, accounts you know that are designated for this type of work if we if we didn't if we didn't impose it or if we didn't do it then either either the work is not going to get done or it's going to get done you know it's going to get kicked down the road and it'll get done when it gets done you know so so in a nutshell that's what happened i mean you know it, it's a i don't think the bill should have went out until the, the billing is accurate and really you know it doesn't certainly shouldn't show it's late to people that aren't late and b you know it's a matter of do you want to do you want to invest and and do the work that you know certainly you know Commissioner Hill is in charge of, you know he he, he certainly wants to get this stuff done wants wants it done efficiently. But the question is, do we want to put that burden on the taxpayer at the rate or at the amount of monies you know that it was originally imposed for? So it is what it is you know, basically you know so. We either redo it, like, a, a uh, like uh, Councillor Farwell is saying, we take another look at it to really figure out what it is that, that was done, why was it done, what, is it, what are the monies being used for, is, is there a clear definition, is this, new, you know, 
this, this storm, they, they use this thing, you know, storm water, catch basins. You know, it, it's sort of like a, a, a fuzzy, fu it's fuzzy math. It's like, oh, we're going we're gonna to basically put, put the new math in, you know, and you've got to explain how you're getting to 2 plus 2 equals 4 in some complicated way. Well, it's the same thing. Uh, how are we going to clean out the storm drains or do the stuff that we normally do, but, but we're using this new EPA blah, 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 you know, way of explaining it to do the simple stuff that needs to get done on a daily basis. So it's a complicated way of doing the old business, old, old, basically the old business that needs to get done. Are we going to do it efficiently and faster, or is it going to be kicked down the road and we do it when we can do it and afford to do it? You know? And it just doesn't get done if, it doesn't, if we don't put in these new fees. Simple as that. In a nutshell. Oh. But we had discussed this that evening. That's all I'm saying. Right. Okay. There you go. Punt back to you. All right. Uh, uh, look. Oh, actually, through the chair. Oh, yeah. Actually, that, um, how does that work? I have someone else. Oh. I'll get back to you. Okay. Councilor Rodriguez. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. Hill. Um, what recourse do businesses have to, de to remedy some of the situation? Because I'm going to give you an example. The association, the Cape Verdean Association, we basically have two toilets. Uh, I think our quarterly bill is around $78 for water and sewer. But guess what our stormwater is? Uh, $110. 100 and something dollars. This is exactly what I think what the council is talking about, where you've got somebody that basically pays as, as little as possible because of the fact that they don't use water or sewer, but because of the storm water, they're now, I mean, our price basically doubled of what we have to pay. And I was talking to David here a few minutes ago, I think his is 400 and something dollars. I'm just saying that we're not really in these businesses that have these little parking lots or whatever the deal is are the ones that actually are getting croaked with this. So what recourses do they have in terms of some sort of an appeal, some sort of a, you know, running to, running to daddy or, you know, grandma and ask for some help or something? I mean, what recourses do, do businesses have? I mean, certainly anybody can appeal to the Stormwater Commission. Uh, but the but the ordinance reads how it reads, and the you know the the billing was set up based off the information that's in the ordinance. So um, the the best thing I could say would be if 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 they have some form of appeal, or if somebody has some form of appeal, or if they have some sort of issue, either they come in and speak with the city engineer to review to make sure that the information is accurate, or they can apply for some form of a waiver through the Stormwater Commission, which I believe is in the ordinance. Yeah, see, the problem that we have is the fact that we are part of, the, part of this machinery called the city government. And it's kind of contrary to what we're doing here if we start filing, uh, you know, abatements all over the place and those kinds of things, you know. But, uh, which, I mean, the reality is that, you know, some businesses are going to see their water bill double and triple and quadruple in some instances. Um, what does the city pay into that stormwater bill? Does the city pay anything? We do not. The city doesn't pay anything. The, the school department. The school department pays nothing into it. That's correct. But they have the vast majority of spaces that are collecting water, so they, the city isn't obligated to pay anything, the school doesn't pay anything, but yet every single business in this community has to pay something. That's correct, Councilor. I, and I don't disagree with, with everyone here. I, I wholeheartedly support the idea that, you know, constituents or someone outside of city government should be on that committee. I think that's a fantastic that? idea. I don't disagree with the fact that the ordinance should be reviewed and simplified. It's difficult to navigate through. Um, I struggle with it. I, I've been dealing with people for the past couple of weeks as they come in, you know, referring to the list um, that was established through the billing process based off of parcels, helping people removing parcels that should not have gotten bills. Um, but it's, it's, it's a difficult ordinance to uh, understand. Yeah. What about what about some of the nonprofits that we have in this community? We've got a lot of a lot of nonprofits that have 
some nice uh, pieces of property. Are they paying their fair share on this thing? They are. It's a utility, so the, it's not a tax, it's a utility. So th as they pay water and sewer fees, they pay the utility fees for the stormwater. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Councilor Giagostino. Thank you. I'll just finish quickly. All right. It sounds like there's going to be a resolve filed to go and, and, and look through this ordinance again a, a little more deeply. So. Okay. I'm just going to tell you, and I don't, if you have any of these answers with you today, that's great, but I don't expect that because I think that I would expect you'd probably have to go and, and, and put, some, put some of this together. So my first thing that I'm going to be looking for when we get back to this is, I guess what I'm wondering is how, and maybe Taunton's the only one doing this, I don't know, how are other communities I'm going to be able to comply with increased requirements without some kind of fees to pay for it. Now, maybe they raise their uh, water rates or sewer rates. I don't know. But I'm, so I'm, I'm, I'd love to know how other communities are, are going to finance these additional costs, right? Because that's basically what we're getting down to. The second thing I'm going to want to know is you said that Previously, yes, we had stormwater system in the city. We had maintenance costs. Those were being done within the budget, but not to the level we're going to be required to, correct? Correct. Okay. So I would like to know, and I think this would be helpful for the people paying for all this to know, what was the standard we were previously, main, or previously or currently, whatever the case is, maintaining to? What are these new standards? What does that entail? What is the, what are those standards cost? In other words, okay, folks, we're collecting this additional revenue from you because we have these new costs and here they are and here's what they cost and here's why we have to bring this money in. You know what I mean? Like just lay it out so that everybody can see exactly these are the new requirements and their costs and show like, okay, and it's going to cost us another I don't know, however many million dollars, and that's what we're raising with this. All right. Um, and I'm just going to comment on the billing thing. <laughs> I don't mean any disrespect, but everybody knows this whole thing is a sore thumb. And then when you mess up the billing, you just take the hammer and smash the thumb again. And again. And again. <laughs> um, you know, we got to get this right, but the other thing... <laughs> With the bigger bills, to my colleague, uh, Councilor Farwell's point, if you've got a piece of land that's going to generate a $40,000 bill, we're going to say, yeah, and you got to pay that in full. It doesn't seem like we should give an option where, like, you know, a single-family home, it's $6 a quarter, right? I don't need a payment plan for my $24 bill. But if you've got a $40,000 bill, some organizations might have that kind of money that they can just pay it and be done with it. Is there... And again, I don't expect an answer right this second, but we should explore a mechanism where maybe somebody with some of these larger bills, maybe there's a threshold, can apply to have a payment plan because maybe they don't have $40,000 cash on hand at the time the bills do, but over a year they could do it. And, and I don't disagree with that, Councillor, and I think we have the ability to kind of work through issues like that through the abatement process, but... Right. Um, you know, and, and, and maybe, you know, we get to a point where, you know, anything that's not a, a residential, single-family residential property getting that $6 a quarter or a $24 uh, $4 bill a year gets a biannual bill. Um, right. You know, and the, the confusion with, with the billing, I mean, again, I apologize, um, but I know the goal and the intent was always to give everybody 90 days to pay a bill. Um, I was not aware that 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 balance would show up on the following utility bill that we were sending out a couple of weeks later. Um, it certainly brought a lot of confusion, and and, and you're right. Um, it's uh, it's unfortunate that it happened, and hopefully this once a year billing will deal with that issue. Being you know um, 30 days from from the date we send out the bill, there won't be any billings in that in that period, and then any prior balance that will show up on someone's bill will be accurate. I'm hopeful that that will resolve that matter. And, 
and I will say one thing, and a lot of people keep talking about Taunton. Um, just so everybody's clear, you know, the city of Taunton, the city of Fall River, the city of New Bedford, the city of Lawrence, all these big communities, um, they capture a lot of these costs in their sewer budgets because they have combined systems where the stormwater and the sewer system are combined. So the goal of this program is to deal with the discharges and the discharges into waterways. A lot of that money because of the combined system in those communities is captured through their sewer funds. So, um, And that's exactly what I'm going to be looking for information on when this comes back up is, again, that's what, I, that's what I was looking for. How are they doing that? Oh, well, they have a combined system. It's not a separate system. That's the kind of detail that I think would be helpful for people to have a better understanding of, and, and us, a better understanding of why we had to do it this way, others didn't have to do it that way, et cetera. And, and again, like I said, and details about what we're going to do with the money. You know, what's the extra cost? What's the, you know, and what are the, you say testing. Well, what does that testing cost? Again, I feel like if you, if, you, I, if you break this down enough for everybody, including not just this council, but the people paying these bills to have a clear understanding, some transparency, right, and real understanding of what is happening here and what the, this is going towards and why it's necessary to bring in additional revenue, again, just, just details um, that, you know, nobody likes to pay more in taxes and fees. I mean, you know, don't get me wrong, but... It's a little easier to swallow when you have some a detailed understanding of, of why and what it's for. Well, and, and, I, th and I, I think some of that clarity will come through the um, budget process to Councilor when we present the budgets. We'll give you kind of a detailed outlay as to where, you know, some of the current costs that are in, you know, the highway budget are being captured in that stormwater budget because they're directly related to the permit um, and potential projects that will be upcoming. So, right. And I and I appreciate that. And I'll conclude with this. I'm not trying to be difficult to the treasurer or the CFO or you. And I don't think any of us is trying to be difficult for the sake of being difficult. But we have to go out and explain why we're voting for this and why we voted for this. And it may not have been this council, but, but you know what I mean? Like, we've got to be able to justify it to our constituents when they ask us about it and more information that we have, the better we can do our jobs in, in helping and in, in doing that. You know what I mean? It's, it's just, that's my context is I want to feel comfortable when I tell people that, you know, we had to do this and here's why we had to do it and why we had to do it this way to be able to explain it better and, and I don't know. Um, yeah, I guess that, that's what I'm saying. So, Understood. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Councilor Farwell. Just, I, I don't know if I'm going to close this out or not, but a, a couple of things just to get on the table. And I read some of the Stormwater Authority minutes. We're talking about hiring engineers, multiple? So we put actually just put an offer out to um, a new position that was just created as assisti assistant city engineer. We had a wonderful candidate. He was a professional engineer. He's a licensed land surveyor. We offered him the position. Uh, he accepted, and then I found out this evening that he declined. So he's moving on, so that job will be posted again. That job was posted for the assistant city engineer looking for a professional engineer for three to four months. Uh, we have one applicant. The one applicant we How about have. about other, we, I notice, other support staff, ad, administrative assistant you're looking for? In we other just, words, do we know ballpark what, what the, we're talking about salaries to implement this stormwater management issue? If you're asking me today, yes. Yes, we do. So, I mean, currently they'll, they'll, there should be um, three civil engineers on staff, um, an ad administrative uh, two position to, to um, work with the city engineer. The sit a portion of the city engineer's uh, money comes out of that budget. Um, the GIS coordinator comes out of that budget because a lot of the stuff is GIS related. Uh, that the Part of the reporting is GIS related. So... Um, Staffing wise, that's where we're at right now. But, but how are you paying? Well, the, the three civil engineers would be new, correct? They're not on staff? So we have two civil engineers. A portion of their salaries are captured through this, and then there's the intent is to hire one more. Okay, so, so we're having people pay water and sewer fees. Some of those 
some of that revenue is paying for the GIS person and two of the civil engineers? For water and sewer fees, no. For the stormwater fees, yes. Stormwater fees. So, the, yes. so there are two new civil engineer positions that started after we... No, just a portion. There's, two, there's two, currently two civil engineers that exist upstairs in DPW. They were paid entirely through the uh, engineering budget. Right. And a portion of their salaries now will be captured by, by the... Okay, but, it, but, and I don't want to spend here all night, but if we were doing that before, why do we now have to pass on extra costs to people for the stormwater fee to partially offset the cost of the, the, uh, the, the, the civil engineers? I mean, by that line of reasoning, we should pass off to Mr. Brophy some money because his staff has to generate billing for stormwater fees. But we it, actually it, do. It, it so, seems so, like we're triple dipping the, the residents. It's an excellent question. The simple answer is, Council, we do. Uh, for all of the enterprises, we capture a portion of the administrative support, what you in a, in a private company you would call back office support. And each of the enterprises pays to the general fund an administrative fee based on that level of support. A few years ago, we actually had an outside company come in and uh, create a new formula because it hadn't been updated in a long time. Um, so you'll see it in this year's budget book and when we present the budget for next year, uh, the budget for the enterprise funds all include that administrative fee going back to the general fund. And the concept, I think, uh, for those partial salaries is actually since the stormwater program is part of their duties, having the enterprise fund pay for a portion of it actually frees up the general fund. Uh, and so that lessens the burden on the general property taxes to support that, that operation. I, I do agree with you that that's, that's what it does. But what it looks like to the residents, I'm already paying certain fees to the city. Now you're taking some of the stormwater fees and you're applying it to a position that basically I'm already funding through my other fees that I'm paying. You see where I'm coming from? Yeah, it, absolutely. I can see where they would, they would say that. And that's why I think discussions like this are good because we can shine a light on the way that we budget not only for stormwater, but for water and sewer and for refuse. Right. Council, as if, if there's nothing else tonight, I'd actually like to move to postpone this to uh, a meeting in April to allow for further information. We can get questions to the commissioner and to Mr. Claxon. I don't think we've settled everything tonight. I'll start working uh, on some things that I think should be tweaked in the ordinance and, and go to our legislative council because I'm, I'm not satisfied with what we have right now. I think we can improve upon it. Second. If that was a motion. <laughs> motion has been made and properly seconded. All in favor? Opposed? Thank you. It carries. Gentlemen, thank you. We'll see you again soon. Thank you, Councilors. <laughs> uh, moments of Councilor's privilege, Councilor Aza. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would just like to remind everybody that we have an ordinance meeting scheduled for this Wednesday, March 8th at 6 p.m. here in Council Chambers. Um, the agenda is posted online and it should be televised by BCA. Thank you. Councilor Farwell. Uh, it just, it's not a moment of personal privilege. Maybe it's a moment of frustration. Uh, we spent a lot, and some of you know I've already said this, we spent considerable funds, thanks to the mayor, upgrading our video and audio here in the council chamber. I actually really believe that we owe to the residents the opportunity to see these meetings live. They ought to be able to see them with clarity. They ought to be able to hear what we're talking about. And let's not forget, folks, it's their money. That franchise fee is 5% of the amount collected from all of the Xfinity customers here in the city. So that $675,000 that we appropriate to 
to uh, Brockton Community Access is their money, and they deserve better. They really do. Uh, and I, I don't know what it's going to take, Madam Chair. I, I guess because I was there once, it's going to fall on your shoulders yes. to get together with the clerk and BCA and fix the damn Internet. It's 2023. If we can't broadcast a meeting out of here with, with the right audio and video, then, then I'm, not sure, I'm not sure what we can do. So I'm sorry to sound frustrated, but this was kind of my baby doing this over. And I'm afraid the baby is, is sick. And I'd like to see that taken care of. Thank you. Thank you. Councilors, this evening we received an invitation from Mayor Sullivan to his state of the city. And we extend that invitation to the public as well, and we'd love to see you show up for it. It's going to be, his speech is going to be given next Wednesday, March 16th, from 6.30 until 7.30 at Brockton High School's Nelson Auditorium. And uh, I, I was asked to urge you all to attend and urge the public to come as well. We'd like to fill the room. Um, so I, I put that out on his behalf. Anything else? Thank you. We are adjourned. <laughs>